Well, good evening. I'd like to call our uh, Monday, October 26th, Fayetteville City Council meeting to order. At this time, we will ask the Reverend Bishop, uh, or the Reverend Chris Davis, where is he at? Pastor Davis, getting a little Mountain Dew. All right. I know. I'm sorry. Didn't mean to tell you. Uh, if we could, please, if we could stand for the prayer, uh, ask that we would uh, repeat at the conclusion of the prayer, repeat the uh, Pledge of Allegiance in unison. Thank you, Mr. Mayor Council. Let's bow our heads, please. Oh, gracious Father, we thank you right now for this opportunity to come together as a community of families again before you. In this place where we do the people's business, God, we pray that you would bless our hearts and our minds, that you would bless our hands, our efforts, and our endeavors, that you would allow us to come together in this moment to do the work that you've given unto us to do. We pray for knowledge, wisdom, and understanding on behalf of your people, the great people of Fayetteville and Cumberland County. God, we thank you right now for the season we're in because it's a great season for us. We thank you for leadership that you're making and grooming in us and for people who love and honor you and love and honor each other. In Jesus Christ's name we pray, amen. amen. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you, Pastor Davis. Uh, Council, we have a few announcements, but before we do that, we'd like to acknowledge a few elected officials in our presence, former city council member and now state senator Kurt Devier and family. How are you? Uh, also, if we could uh, acknowledge Representative Billy Richardson. How are you, sir? Glad, glad to have you tonight. Any other electeds in the audience? Okay. All right. With that, I'll go to uh, Council Member Dawkins. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, we are very fortunate in our city uh, with Methodist University, and uh, I'm holding up a Rembrandt Van Ryn uh, brochure. Uh, the exhibit is no charge. Uh, you can register. You have to have a ticket, though. You have to register at davidmccunegallery.org. Uh, as someone who has uh, visited the Rijksmuseum in Amsterdam, where the majority of Rembrandt van Rijn's um, art uh, is on display, this particular display at Methodist University in the McCune Gallery is absolutely stunning. It's, um, it, it will affect your life. Um, he did this work with a uh, needle on copper plates and then reproduced his etchings. There's, there's probably about 120 uh, different etchings, and some of the etchings depict the story, stories in the Bible. So if you have uh, young kids or, or uh, older kids, they will benefit from, from this particular uh, display. Uh, it's a grant, uh, an anonymous grant from a uh, community, um, Cumberland Community Foundation member, and also uh, the Arts Council uh, also made a uh, grant which uh, this city council supports. And um, Mr. Mayor, uh, I'm not much on art. I'm, I'm learning as I get older uh, to appreciate um, abilities, God given ability, but Rembrandt and Van Gogh are probably the two most famous Dutch masters. So if you can't get over to Amsterdam, this is just about as good. So thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you. You sound pretty knowledgeable to me. So, uh, uh, All right, go to Council Member Ingram. Thank you, Mayor. And um, I'm glad that we are uh, talking about our great colleges and universities here in Fayetteville. So I have two quick announcements. Fayetteville State University recently signed an MOU with Meharry Medical College and um, to better understand dental and medical in, um, in this state. And I just want to point out, Fayetteville State University is the oldest public uh, HBCU in the state of North Carolina. And for us to be uh, hopefully leading in our medical understandings, we are also uh, the leading school for uh, cyber security as well. So I wanted to announce that uh, we have that and we are really, really excited for Federal State University. Uh, secondly, uh, October 31st is the last day to early vote in the state of North Carolina. 
Um, there are early voting locations where you can one stop register to vote, meaning you can register and vote at the same time. Um, so please make sure you do your civic duty and register and vote um, in the state of, state of North Carolina. Thank you so much. Thank you, Bronco Pride for sure. Uh, the the Mayherry partnership is very significant because uh, Mayherry is, is one of the few, if not the only, uh, HBCU that is also a medical and dental school. 40% of the, the uh, black dentists in the country have matriculated through Mayherry. So huge opportunity to put more professional uh, physicians and health providers to cover the southeast uh, with this partnership. So good job. Thank you for mentioning that. Uh, with that, I will go to uh, Ms. Rebecca. Can you meet me at the podium, ma'am? So the mayor is congratulating um, the city of Fayetteville and Miss Rebecca for the um, the award of X. They got the certificate of excellence from ICMA, which is the International City County Management Association. This certificate of excellence is presented to Fayetteville, North Carolina, for proceeding the standards established by the International City County Management Association and the identification and public reporting of key outcome measures surveying both residents and employees and the performance management and all the organization's culture. Presented in con conjunction with the 106 ICMA Annual Conference, September 24th, 2020. So congratulations, and if I am not mistaken, this is not the first time we've gotten this award? This is the fourth in excellence. So before Rebecca's, <laughs> before she speaks, I had the honor of going with her one night at a conference to get the award we went up together to get the award and then we had a dinner afterwards we sat down at the table and I realized I was so out of my league there everybody in that room was so smart and so data driven and they just thoroughly enjoyed ourselves so we literally have the best of the best and thank you for everything that you're doing thank you, ma'am I would just say thank you so much for those kind words, um, but I'd like to thank the city manager's office and the city of Fayetteville City Council for really championing those efforts for the city of Fayetteville to be a high performing organization. And then I'd also like to thank staff because there's no way, this is not the Rebecca Strategy and Performance Analytics Office, there's only two of us, me and uh, Mr. Chris McMillan, Christopher McMillan, he is our senior um, analyst in the spa. Without his efforts, this would not be possible. And of course, without the teamwork of all of the city staff, this would not be possible. So thank you all. Right. Appreciate thank it. Thank you, ma'am. And kind of uh, put this in layman terms, these are the, the things that make organizations great. They, they give us the information that we need, the feedback and, and the responses and to how to stay focused on the city's priorities and tasks, which help us deliver great service. So thank you, Mr. Manager, your team. Uh, very well deserved, and Ms. Rebecca is one of the best. At this time, before we go to a very special uh, moment, I'd like to ask Mr. Scott Bullard if he could come give us a brief update on COVID. Mr. Bullard, how are you, sir? I'm well, sir. I hope you are. Good evening, Council, Mayor, Mayor Pro Tem, and everybody tuning in. Today marks 225 under state of emergency for us. Um, there are 210 days of restrictions um, that we're among at this moment. Um, this is actually day three of Safer at Home, phase three, first extension. That's to say a lot, but <laughs> when you don't have an endpoint, you just have to count it. So, and that's what we're doing. Again, this is all data driven. We're proud to it and, and very glad to um, applaud 231,611 people have recovered from the COVID virus. That's an important number. When you subtract that out from the 261,742 cases at this hour, 
that leaves us somewhere in the neighborhood of 30,000 plus folks that may be sick in one form or another, and our prayers and best thoughts are with them. And to those families that have lost loved ones, which there's 4,170 um, at, at this hour. Here in the county, um, we occupy 6,931 of those cases since it started, and we've had 98 um, residents that we've lost as a result, sadly. But uh, from a percent positive situation, we seem to kind of bounce along. Um, I, I think today we're at 7%, which is tracking right behind 6.6% that the state is at. And as we discussed here together before, our goal is five or less of percent positive of the total. And we want to see that continue to whittle down. Um, there have been some places that have beat that goal, but they've um, gone back up, and that's not a good thing either. That's something we're concerned about. I know the last time I stood before you, I championed flu shots. I'll say it again. That's one thing we can correct for. So with the season that we're about to coast into, we want to, to make sure that that's uh, on the radar. <clears throat> Another thing that's being planned that I just want to underscore tonight, as this vaccine from however many vendor sources it actually um, evolves from is possibly going to be one of the largest logistical um, operations that many of us have ever seen in our lifetime. And what I mean by that, we're going to have a product that will have to be prioritized when it goes out, and the state has a plan that meshes with the federal plan because there won't be enough at one shot, so there will be a distribution process to it. But with that being said, it, it's also a little difficult because this will be a refrigerated product. Mm. So that makes it a little more challenging. Um, there's a lot of uh, bright and uh, well-capable people working on that problem right now, um, and, and it's hard to plan for something that you don't have complete grasp and hold of yet. But there are people getting ready. Um, the state submitted their plan to the feds here in the last week or so. There'll be feedback on that, and eventually on the local level, which we're already doing what we can do um, within the limitations of what we know to prepare for that. It's going to be a big deal, um, no matter what else is going on. And that what else is going on, um, tonight I'm going to just take a moment to say we really um, feel for the Gulf region of the country right now. Um, Zeta became a hurricane this afternoon about mid-afternoon, so that's 27 named storms this year, seven of which have knocked on the Gulf. Mm. That's pretty tough. It is tough. Their saving grace is the fact that the water's getting a little bit cooler right now. Otherwise, we could be talking about devastation. Yeah. And there are 35 more days of hurricane season to go. And we've already set a record getting to 27 named storms. So we just pray that that door will shut as quickly as possible. And I'll be subject to any questions or comments you all have. Thank you, Mr. Bullard. Uh, Councilman Wright? Uh, yes, Mr. Bullard. Uh, talk to us a little bit about testing, uh, where we are with testing, and how does that work throughout the county? By all reports, and, and I won't pretend to speak for, for Cumberland County Department of Public Health, but we've got a good partnership going there. Um, the testing continues to surge and roll out. I know their numbers have improved with getting results, turnaround time, if you will. Um, if you ask the state, and even probably on the local level, they're going to say we don't have enough testing, and surely we don't maybe meet their metrics yet. Um, so we're encouraging it um, at every turn. Um, they're starting to advertise the results from the antigen testing, which is not quite as good as the gold standard PCR testing, but it's a quicker test for certain populations. And really that's better left probably in the hands of the clinicians because for the antigen testing, the best result is when you're in a COVID positive situation where someone in the family unit has had it or you've had um, wide community spread in the area in which you live. Otherwise, there's flaws and errors and that sort of thing. Um, my understanding is the only way to keep up with what's available is to look at that website that County Public Health has because these pop-ups, I can't pretend to track them. Um, there'll be something new tomorrow I didn't even know about, but as we see it, we we try to encourage it and get it out. All right. Thank you, sir. Yes, sir. Uh, Council Member Waddell. Thank you. Mr. Bullard, when you refer to the pop-ups, are you talking about testing locations? Yes, ma'am. Just impromptu. So do we have a, a listing of 
any free testing locations because I've received several inquiries from citizens throughout the community asking where there might be a listing of free testing locations. Y yes, ma'am. My uh, Again, it, it kind of goes back to public health is, is in the know about most of those, and we just – in, in my office, when we get that same call, we direct them or divert them to Public Health's website. Um, and the reason we do that, um, probably most importantly, is a lot of these are appointment-based, unless there's some special provision made, and that's just to manage the supplies and, and manage the volume they have. So sometimes they need to call ahead or make some sort of online appointment. So when you say Public Health's website, mm -hmm. because I want to go and find that now, we're going to the Department of Health and Human Services here in Cumberland County or? Go to Cumberland County's master site and then the departments have a header at the top. Just click on public health and it should be, if it's not the first thing that pops up next to their COVID jump page there, it should be right next to that. Thank you so much. And if there are any requests for information or anything, my office is glad to handle it because like I said, we'll get a call that all of a sudden something's going to pop up, and it, it may not even make the website, but there's some specific targeting going on, too, for those underserved groups. And, and some of that doesn't affect the general population. Thank you. Uh, Council Member Ingram. Thank you, Matt. Sorry. Thank you, Mr. Bullock. Um, my quick question was, we were talking about numbers and being able to track. Do you foresee that you know, statewide, and it's hard to tell, do you foresee uh, we may go back into pretty much a shutdown as we transition over into flu season? I think there's a legitimate fear mm -hmm. of a, some people call it a secondary spike, a surge, whatever the term um, that's used for. You're seeing some states across the country, probably the Midwest right now is getting hammered um, by the press for some sort of resurgence. Um, the hard part with that whole process is is judging because not everybody used the same set of restrictions. So things were not exactly equal in what was permitted, what was not. But uh, my hope is that we don't go back to phase two and that we can manage maybe prolonging phase three because there's going to be some economic consequences there that I don't think we've yet dreamed or visualized how bad that, that might end up being. Thank you, Mr. Bullen. Thank you for all that you're doing. All right, uh, Ms. Bullock, thank you, sir. All right, uh, Council, before we go to Council Member Hare, we all know that uh, we have a very significant day, uh, November the 3rd, next Tuesday. Um, that being said, I had a lot of uh, citizens and e different inquiries to want to know, uh, is the city prepared for the day after the election? And so I know that Mr. Manager and Chief have, have had that, that conversation, but Chief, I know you can't share with us intimate details, but what you can, just to assure the public, uh, we're, we're watching this just in case there were any issues. Yeah, thank you, Mayor. Um, so basically, we've been aware of um, the proposed threats, not just across the nation, but at every city, including ours. So with that, we are monitoring as much as possible through um, our partners with federal entities, as well as we keep a monitor of any type of traction out there. And it's not just the day after that we're preparing for, we'll be prepared for staying vigilant for at least a week afterwards, um, just for the atmosphere. We know that um, we're restricted from being, um, law enforcement restricted from being at polling sites on the day of the election, but we are gonna be accessible to respond. Uh, we'll work also with the Sheriff Department to make sure any type of issues that the polling sites has, we're able to respond to those locations. Um, we shouldn't see anything. Um, we don't have anything right now. We're saying this a, a serious threat, but we're very much aware and we're staying vigilant just like the rest of um, the country. So it's on our radar and it will be on our radar for a minute. Okay, thank you, Chief. All right. Appreciate that. All right, uh, Council, at this time, we have a special moment. Uh, I will call on s former council member Senator Kurt Devier if he could uh, come to the podium and, podium and tell us what you have, sir. So, Representative Billy Richardson. I guess I'm turning this way. I guess I'm speaking this way. Representative Richardson, if you'll come up. 
Um, thank you, uh, Mayor and Council. It's, uh, it's always good to be back in the chambers and not have to be on that side of the dais. <laughs> Um, but thank you for all the work that you do across the community, and that's part of why we're here tonight. Um, we want to recognize uh, a member of your distinct body um, with an award tonight, and uh, I'm going to say a couple words. I'm going to let uh, Represent Representative Richardson speak for our delegation, uh, our Cumberland County delegation, and then I'll uh, make a couple other words, and we'll ask um, a member to come down. So. Uh, about probably 12, 18 months ago, um, we began a process to recognize somebody that has done an amazing amount of work in this community. And so this is a culmination of that work. Um, and uh, I, it's an honor for me to be here tonight to present this award. And I'm gonna let uh, Representative Richardson talk about from the delegation standpoint, and then I'll talk about the award. Is it okay if I, yeah. okay. I, I want this particular gentleman to uh, see my face when, when I make this presentation, or help make this presentation tonight. It's with a, first off, let me say it's a real honor to be here tonight and to see all of you all uh, hard at work. Um, my heart and my prayers are go out to each of you. You all have such a hard job, and you do it with such joy and with such, love in your heart for this community and you do such wonderful work and don't think it's not uh, unappreciated or don't think it's not unnoticed it, it is we in the delegation see what you all do every day and you all are on the front lines and and your compassion and your competence and the way that you all uh, work in this city is just remarkable and um, the older i get and the more i see uh, this is a great council. It's got a great mayor. You all do wonderful work. And one of your members has really done an amazing job. And it is uh, the delegation's privilege tonight to uh, have the governor's back and to have our senators back uh, in, in helping make this presentation. And, and I want him to see that it's coming from my heart because I, I didn't know Reverend Hare like I've gotten to know him in the past year. And what I saw out on the campaign trail, my campaign really was in the, in, the, in the spring. What I saw out there every night was this gentleman at every um, community meeting, oh, yeah. at every neighbor's door that had a need, at every dedication. I've never seen such a commitment to a community that uh, Reverend Hare has. Um, it's one thing to be a minister. It's another thing to be a minister of God. And what I see in you, Reverend Hare, is I see a man that loves the Lord, but loves the Lord's people in a way that's just remarkable. Um, I brought a book tonight. I'm a big fan of Lincoln, not the Lincoln that uh, was on the debate last week, but uh, the real Lincoln. And um, there was a a, a quote that, that summed him up that I think really applies to you. And I, th and, uh, I was talking to Marvin Lucas, and he, he said to tell you that he is here in spirit, that he is actually working on his church's search committee. And he said he would knew you would be mighty upset if, you missed a church me if he missed a church meeting. So, but he said to tell you he loved you, he's happy for you, and he, he wants you to know that this, uh, this award cannot happen to a finer person. And we all on the delegation agree with our dean on that. But, but listen, listen to these words, because they really apply to you. He was not born a king of men, but a child of common people, who made himself a great persuader, therefore a leader. By, by the dint of firm resolve, patient effort, and dogged perseverance, he slowly won his way to eminence and fame by doing the work that lay next to him, doing it with all his growing might, doing it as well as he could, and learning by his failure, when failure was encountered, how to do it better. He was open to all impressions and influences and gladly profited by the teaching of events and circumstances, no matter how adverse or unwelcome. There was probably no year of his life 
where he was not a wiser, cooler, or better man than he had been the year preceding. Reverend Hare, that summarizes you. And you have been a tremendous gift to this community. And we are indeed so grateful for your service. And we hope and pray that that service will continue for many, many, many more years. Thank you, Representative Richardson. So this journey, like I said, started about 12 months ago for me, um, but thanks to COVID <laughs> um, and everything else, uh, it's slowed down the process a little bit. But for Councilman Hare, this started many, many years ago um, because he has given to this community time and time again, whether he was serving on city council, he was working in the community either in his church um, or when he wasn't on city council, working in this community watch groups um, and doing so many things. You can see his fingerprints across the community. community. I remember way before I was a council member uh, watching Councilman Hare fight for Murkison Road. He was a lone voice sometimes on council yelling about Murkison Road and the need to have an investment there. I watched him put a crosswalk in at Right, right by Fayetteville State for our students to make sure our students were safe. Um, you know, the little things that he does to make sure that his constituents are taken care of every day. The things that none of us see and that a lot of us elected officials do day in, day out, never get recognized. So this is in a small way, just a recognition of those, of who you are as a person, your character, but more importantly, your heart because you truly have a heart of the people. I've said that always, uh, and, and I, will, I will say it forever. You can see that, the way the people react to you when you go to the door to, to say hello or to check on them, and I've seen it firsthand. So I also have one other message. So I'm gonna ask Council Member Hare to come up. Um, we're gonna present him with the highest order that you can receive from the governor of the state of North Carolina, the order of the Longleaf Pine and we're gonna present that to him tonight and read it, but also have a message from the governor who DJ is a good friend with. And uh, he said he's got a lot going on right now, <laughs> um, but he wanted to send his regards when I spoke to him and uh, said that uh, he signed a few of these and, and it was, uh, he really enjoyed signing this one because he knew you and he knew who you were as a person. Um, and I'll also tell you that we've done a few of these as a delegation since I've been a senator. And you begin to reach out across the community. And Mayor, thank you for your words in this one and your help in putting this together and reaching some of the people we needed to reach. The amount of letters and support that came out from this community just again speaks to who you are, DJ. So with that, we're gonna present you with this order. You want me to read it or you wanna read it? Billy? All right, let's see if I can read this. Thank God I can see tonight. <laughs> All right. State of North Carolina, from Roy Cooper, governor, reposing special confidence in the integrity, learning, and zeal of DJ Hare. I do by this presents confer the Order of the Longleaf Pine with the rank of ambassador extraordinaire privileged to enjoy fully all rights granted to members of this exalted order among which is a special privilege to propose the following North Carolina toast in select company anywhere in the free world. And here's the toast. Here's to the land of the longleaf pine, the summer land where the sun does shine, where the weak grow strong and the strong go grow great. Here's to the down home, the old North State. Signed, Roy Cooper, October 20th, 25th, 2020. <laughs> Please come up here. Yeah, we could lock you up. You're part of the team. <laughs> One, two, three.
Thanks, Mayor and Council. Mayor Pro Tem, for you all just giving me an opportunity to uh, receive this award here at Council Chambers. If we were not, not have been in COVID, I was thinking I would have been at my church, but what better place to be than one place that I've served now going on 20 years. Um, thank you, Senator Devier. I appreciate you. I appreciate that you found enough in me to even initiate me getting this award this evening. That means a lot to me. I have, uh, I've been serving a long time, and it's, it feels good, and you know this, Bishop, to receive an award for something that you love doing. I don't particularly like going back and forth as far as the, the, the part that deals with me as an elected official. I'm not a back and forth person. I just like serving. And I'm honored tonight that they were thought enough to award me this award. I, I started serving when I was probably eight or nine years old, running back and forth, taking my father's Bible into the poor pit as a kid, as he was a pastor, to his death. Until today, I'm, I'm still serving. So thank you. It's been a great year. Thanks my family that's here, my sister, my, one of my nephews, my oldest brother, and God has treated me well in this life. We all fall down, but thank God when I fell one time when I got back up, there standing was my baby. I call the baby girl, Wendy. She has been a blessing to me. So thank you, honey, as we continue to get out here and continue to work. We're not done. <laughs> we appreciate the award, but this doesn't mean the end. We got many, many more years that we want to continue to do what we're doing for citizens across Fayetteville and across the nation. So once again, thank you all. And let's just move forward and get on with the city's business tonight. Amen? Amen. Thank you. Thank you all. I hear family, Senator Devier, Representative Richardson. Good work. All right, Council, we'll move to um, item 5.0 was the proof of the agenda. I think there was one item that was asked to be pulled by the submitter of it. Uh, so, Councilman Wright. Yes, Mr. Mayor, I move to approve uh, the agenda for tonight. And it was one item, 8.01, for discussion. No, to, remo no, uh, to, to, to remove, to remove, it to to remove and to table 8.1 at this time. Mr. Mayor, could I help with that? Please. So it would be to approve the agenda with the removal of item 8.01. Okay. Thank you, uh, City Attorney. Uh, Mr. Mayor, uh, that is to approve the agenda with the removal of item 8.01. Item 8 okay. 
All right, there's a motion by Council Member Wright. There was a second by Council Member Dawkins to approve with the removal of item 8.01 discussion. You had a question, Council Member Banks? Is it on the agenda? Is it on the agenda? We're, we're coming to consent next. Okay. All right. So, Council, uh, any discussion on the motion? All right, look to you for your votes. Madam Clerk, that is uh, nine to zero. Nine voting in favor. Okay, well, however you need to do it. <laughs> All right, Councilman Dog. Uh, Mr. Mayor, motion to approve consent agenda and pull item 6.08 for discussion. All right, there's, there's a motion by Councilman Dawkins to uh, approve with the removal of 6.08 uh, second by Councilmember Davis. Discussion I have, Councilmember Banks McGlove. Yes, Mayor, I would like to um, remove, well, not remove, but, um, well, yeah, take off 6.08 for an up and down vote. Yeah, that, that's the one they just called out. Yeah. I think that's the same one that he just oh, made I thought he said eight something. Okay. Okay, same one. Thank you. All right, there's a motion on the floor to uh, approve with the exception of item 6.08. There's a second by Councilmember Davis. Uh, dis uh, further discussion, Councilmember Waddell? Ma'am, I'm actually asking if we can also remove 6.013 simply for the purposes of staff to present and, and make the public aware of what this actually, what we're doing with this funding that we, we allocated in the budget for the communities and school programs, just to, just to highlight that information for the purposes of our, of our public. Well, um, so there's a motion on the floor. So one of two ways. So basically you were okay with it. You just wanted to explain publicly. Yeah, right? I'm just asking that we amend. Um, I, I don't, it, we amend the um, motion that's been made to include pulling item 6.013 for staff presentation okay. of that the item. That would be up to the discretion of those who first and second that. All right. So there's an amended motion, friendly amendment, to uh, include item 6.03 uh, as well. Uh, any further discussion? All right, Council, I'll look to you for your votes. Madam Clerk, it is unanimous. All right, item 6.08, Council Member Dawkins. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, Ms. Brawls, if you could come up and possibly Mr. Tolan. Uh, CFO, I'm going to ask you about the uh, an estimate, although I know it's unaudited right now, on the um, net fund balance. Um, Ms. Brawls, is this money, uh, it's, it's from last year's budget, and we're, we didn't spend it, but we had it allocated, and then now we have to spend it now because of we have encumbered that money. Sure. The lion's share of this budget ordinance amendment is what we call reappropriating budget that was available in last fiscal year. The fiscal year closed June 30. So a portion of the, the ordinance appropriation is for funds that were encumbered. We've issued purchase orders or we had contracts outstanding that we had not fully paid the vendors because the work had not been completed at that point. And then the other portion is for items that we refer to as designated. Uh, generally, if a department had items funded in their budget that they planned to do in that fiscal year, but for any number of reasons was not able to get it accomplished, for instance, COVID-19, then they're requesting to roll that budget forward to this fiscal year for expenditure. And the total is around? For the, for the general fund, we, we look at it kind of fund by fund. So for the general fund, that total is, uh, I believe it's $4.6 million. A over $4 million. Okay. Thank you, Ms. Brawls. Yeah. And um, Mr. Tolan, an estimate on the unaudited uh, net fund reserve. Um, and, I, and the other part of my question is, do we foresee any, uh, do we have other monies encumbered that we need maybe next month to have to do a budget ordinance amendment? Let's, I know that's a, a lot to throw at you, and I know you're in the middle of the audit, but I, kind of a quick update. I'll Thank start, you. I'll start with the first question. Um, so the general fund unappropriated fund balance is 25.3 million or 14.4% of the general fund. Um, 
And then the second question is kind of hard to really nail down, especially with the type of environment that we're in to see what even next month holds. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. I, uh, Council Lady Banks McLaughlin may oh, have a question on this item, Council Member. Yes, well, I don't have my computer in front of me, unfortunately, but um, from just looking at the um, amendment, those funds that you guys um, discussed, that's, those funds are allocated to what was listed. Because I, I want to say I, I ran, I don't have it in front of me, but I ran across, um, I think it was 50000 going towards the market house, um, funds going towards uh, the renovation of some of the parks and recreation centers? Yes, ma'am. We provided you a, a listing oh, of some of the items for which the funds were designated. So uh, I think we went, we kind of went the largest okay. down to, to 50000 and, and again, then we those were funds are already small. allocated. Yes, ma'am. Okay, thank you. All right, uh, uh, Councilman Dawkins. Motion to approve item number 6.08, Mr. Mayor. All right, there's a motion by Councilmember Dawkins to approve item 6.08. There's a second by Councilmember Davis. Uh, seems like we've discussed the motion. All right, no dis seeing none, I'll look to you for your votes, Council. Uh, Madam Clerk, that motion carries nine to one. Of voting in favor, uh, Councilman Davis, Dawkins, Wright, Colvin, Jensen, Ingram, Hare, Kinston, and Waddell. Those voting opposed, Councilmember Banks McLaughlin. All right, uh, item 6.0. One, one, which one was it? One, three. Okay, 6.013, Councilmember Waddell. Thank you so much. So, if we can have a member of staff come up, I really just wanted to. Uh, have some explanation for the sake of our viewing audience on what this particular item, where this funding will be going and how it will be helping our students um, at, at Nick Gerald's and in our, in our Cumberland County School System. How that really to speak to the level of partnership that we're entering into with the Cumberland County Public Schools by assigning this $80,000 of funding to support a, a position at the school system. If you'll just kind of run through that a little bit. Yes, ma'am. Uh, Chris Colley, uh, Acting Director, Economic Community Development. Um, so, Council allocated $80,000 to support P4P during the budget process. Um, we met with P4P. We talked about some of the uh, pathways for prosperity, some, some of the efforts that are going on throughout the community. Um, one of the efforts that came out of that was uh, some early childhood education and, and, and childhood development type efforts. And, and so in working with a not-for-profit that is, it was interested in coming to Cumberland County, um, Communities and Schools of North Carolina, uh, we were able to identify a way to deploy the funding that council approved in order to target some, one of the, um, the data-driven neediest schools in, in our community. Um, so we, we had a little bit of a balancing, balancing act on picking which school we went with. We con consulted with the school board and with the superintendent of schools and, and, and came to the conclusion that Nick Gerald's was, was the right place to go right now. Um, it, it may not be the one that hits the most metrics, um, but it was well equipped to receive uh, th this type of support. So it was, it was in that metric kind of area and it wasn't the, the you know, it was, it was in that kind of happy medium of, of being somewhere that was really needed, but also was capable of accepting the support and having the administration in place to, to help the program be successful. So Communities and Schools in general is a not-for-profit organization that seeks to uh, use a program that um, kind of helps with uh, uh, training parents and students on, on how to be academically successful. Um, one of their programs that they use in that CIS, the Communities and Schools model, is called Parent University. And that's, that's a program designed to increase engagement and resilience through case management. So think a step beyond a guidance counselor and more into a social worker um, at, at a school who is, is working through an evidence-based program to increase outcomes in, in, in this elementary school. Um, after looking at the, the data, um, one in four children live in poverty. 42.9% um, of single mothers live in poverty, and 18% of children born in poverty are likely to end up worse off than their parents. Uh, using the Communities and Schools program to provide integrated supports 
through the student support specialist, which is the position that council will be supporting. Uh, they're, they are hoping to increase those metrics. So one of the ways that they're trying to do that is to, uh, is to put the student support specialist into Nick Gerald's middle school. Um, right now, 29% of the students entering sixth grade uh, are, are rated as being proficient and 82.9% of the students are economically disadvantaged. Um, Cumberland County Schools felt that the principal has indicated a need for additional wraparound supports for students and families and will welcome the initiative with open arms. Uh, using this model, the communities and schools expects to show improvement in two or more of the following areas, academics, behavior, coursework, or social, emo social emotional learning and parental engagement. In 2018 to 2019, CIS case managed students in the Northeast area of North Carolina and the program area now for Cumberland County celebrated a 98% graduation rate, 92% of students promoted to the next grade level because of, and because behavior was a primary focus, 92% of students improved their behavior. The model is identified to identify student needs and provide interventions. So as of right now, uh, council has authorized uh, 12 months of funding. And so uh, if, if, if this model is, is what council supports tonight, then we'll move forward with working out a contract and get it started hiring and get somebody into school as soon as possible. Thank you, sir. Do, do you have any more questions? Uh, I had a couple I'll, of I'll defer to anybody else that may have some questions. Thank okay, you. Thanks. Uh, Councilman Wright. Yes, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, and I appreciate uh, Councilwoman uh, while they're bringing this item out because it gives us an opportunity for the citizens to see the work that P4P is doing in partnering not only with the city but with other agencies throughout uh, the, uh, the community and also uh, Cumberland County school systems, which is important. One of the, and I just wanted to say the uh, great job, Christopher, and uh, uh, Angel uh, Wright Lanier and her, her group is working with P4P uh, and being the uh, uh, being the point of contact for for that agency, I'm very proud of the work that P4P is doing in the community. And so, when you look at the background of this uh, community in schools, North Carolina uh, is it's not a, a nonprofit organization. Uh, it facilitates evidence based model, and it goes on to say the student support and establishes partnerships between service agencies incorporations, foundations, and the community. Their goal is to effectively address the academic, social, and via non-educational resources that are at-risk youth need to succeed in obtaining an education and graduating from high school on time. And so I'm very excited about this, uh, if you will, uh, this satellite uh, program and I, I want to just thank the council for supporting these efforts. So thank you so much. Thank you, Councilman Wright. Council Member Kinston. Thank you, Mayor. I just had one question. I wanted to know if there was any um, match funding and then what is the next step? So, so this funding approved by council uh, hires the fourth out of out of out of four student support specialists. Um, I can't speak to where communities and schools gets the rest of their funding from, but uh, there, this funding was not predicated on a match of any, any, any kind. Um, the next step would be for um, our team to work with communities and schools to draw up a contract uh, so that they can have authorization to begin hiring and filling that position. Okay, thank you. Thank you, all right. Council, uh, Councilmember Member Waddell. Okay, thank you, sir. So first, I'd, I would like to, um, when, I, when, I, when I'm disagreeable publicly, I like to be agreeable publicly. And so, Council Member Wright, I want to, if I had a hat on, I'd take it off and tip it to you on this one because I remember as we were going through budgeting, I was scratching my head and saying, what in the heck are we putting $80,000 towards? Now that I see where it's going, I'm very grateful for your tenacity and your continued effort in making sure that this made it into the budget. This is a very important, important and needed opportunity for our students. And I, I think that both Council Member Ingram and myself, because this is a school that serves our districts. Absolutely. And we know what's happening in this school where our children are concerned. And so I want to tell you publicly, thank you. You did a good job. Thank you, Councilwoman Waddell. I appreciate that. And I hope that this could continue throughout for years to come. 
to make this program more viable for our students that are struggling in poverty. Absolutely, and because you have done the work to get this in the budget, if you will make the motion, I will second it. All right, well, I make a motion, um, Mr. Mayor, Please. Um, that we would um, pass this agenda item at this time. And I so, second. So there's a motion to approve item 6. Point yeah, 013 is uh, by Council Member Wright, second by Council Member Waddell. Uh, we've had great discussion on this. Council, I'll look to you for your vote. All right, Adam Clark, that is unanimous. Motion carries. Good work, Chris, also too. Uh, and uh, Adam from P4P, &P. great work. All right, Council item 7.0 is the public hearing. Uh, public hearing individuals desiring to speak at the public hearings must have signed up to speak with the city clerk by name and address before 7 p.m. this evening. 15 minutes will be allowed for each side of an issue at the public hearing. Individual speakers will be limited to three minutes each unless by previous arrangement a single spokesperson is designated, in which case that spokesperson may utilize the entire 15 minutes. Uh, when the clerk calls your name, we'll acknowledge uh, the presence of those who have signed up to speak. Please clearly state your name and address for the record, and then you may begin addressing the city council. And uh, we have a system of lights or numbers or letters or time that will tell us. And when you have 30 seconds, uh, we will have our amber light. If you're not able to see that, we'll make sure that you know that you have 30 seconds remaining. And at the end of your allotted time, the timer will ring. And at this time, I'll defer to you, Ms. Ms. Baptiste. Good evening. This is case number P2027F. 20, 20 the applicant is Lori Apple of um, Larry King and Associates. The owners of the property is Aspen Points LLC as well as Crystal Lake Apartments LLC. The request is to rezone an existing apartment complex from SF10 to mixed residential five. The acreage of the property is approximately 33.27 acres. It's in District 3. Staff and the Zoning Commission have recommended approval of this item. And this item was um, first presented last month um, as a consent item and was pulled um, for a public hearing. The subject property is located off of MacArthur Road, um, just south of Rose Hill Road and north of Ramsey Street. According to the zoning map, this area is zoned SF10 with um, MR5 zoning, zone property across the street. The property across the street is actually the MacArthur Park um, Apartments. According to the future land use plan, um, a portion of this property should be um, designated as high density residential, and the re remaining portion of the property should be done as low density residential. High density residential is defined in the land use plan as townhomes and apartments in three to five story buildings and low density um, residential is defined as mainly single family residential and occasionally duplexes. As you can see from the site plan, this complex is um, developed already. These are the lot, the buildings, and the entrance is here off of MacArthur Road. The subject property was annexed between 1990 and 2009. This complex was initially approved just prior to the um, current UDL going into effect in 2011. At the time it was developed, this property was zoned R10. Since it's been, um, since the adoption of the new UDO, this property has a zoning of SF10. The difference between the R10 zoning district and the SF10 zoning district is that this complex was allowed to be developed in the R10. In the SF10, it is not allowed. 
So the applicant has requested to be rezoned to MR5 to match its current use and to allow um, that if anything happened to any of the buildings, that they would be able to reconstruct and redevelop those buildings. So they're asking to be brought into compliance with our current UDO. The adjacent properties to the north is vacant, to the south are single family residential, and to the east, just across MacArthur Road, is the MacArthur Park Apartments and various commercial developments. Again, staff, is staff and the Zoning Commission have recommended approval of this rezoning to MR5 based on the following. The proposed zoning map amendment implements the policies adopted by the Unified Development Ordinance and the future land use plan. The use is permitted by the proposed change in zoning district classification and standards are applicable to such uses with the appropriate in the immediate and appropriate with the immediate area. And there are no other factors which will substantially affect health, safety, morals, or, or the general welfare. Staff is available for any questions um, once you open the public hearing. And there are two callers on the line um, in favor of the application that are also a uh, able to answer questions on this application. All right. Thank you, ma'am. Um, council, uh, we'll try to hold our questions until after they've spoken, if you don't mind. So uh, with that, we'll open the public hearing. Madam Clerk. May we have two speakers. Our first speaker is Miss Laurie Epler. Uh, Miss Epler, how are you? I am well. How are you? Thank you. Doing well. Please state your name and address for us. Laurie Epler. Business address is 1333 Morganton Road. Thank you. You have the floor, Miss Epler. Um. As staff reported to you, this development was developed prior to the UDO. It was approved and developed prior to the UDO, and it was completed and built prior to UDO zoning. Um, once the UDO zoning came into effect, the SF10 converted over to, I'm sorry, the R10 converted over to SF10, which made all of the residential buildings, all 196 units, non-conforming. Uh, the current owner has re recently bought out a partner in this development, and upon that closing, they realized that the development had been made non-conforming by UDO zoning. So they are merely asking that what is already there, what's developed, what is built, be brought in compliance with the ordinance, and just to give you some history, I will give you a short version of a very long story. Probably 30 years ago, this property was owned by J.P. Riddle. Um, Mr. Riddle had promised Country Club North, which is the subdivision to the south of this property, that he would never put in a road to connect them to, to MacArthur Road. Later, many years later, his son attempted to develop this property as multifamily. And at that time, the connectivity index that the city staff wanted to implement on his design would have required him to connect Country Club North to MacArthur Road. He had already begun preparations to build buildings there. Um, he immediately stopped that development. His father had given those folks in Country Club North his word that he would never connect them to MacArthur Road. So that property sat vacant for probably 10 or 12 years. Another member of the Riddle family uh, decided later on, back around 2008, 2009, to try it again they were able to get city staff to approve a design that did not connect Country Club North to MacArthur Road. They built that project and that's what you see before you tonight. Um, the current owners understand that that promise was made many years ago. 
their development is is complete. Thank, thank you, Ms. Epler. <laughs> Madam Clerk. Mayor, our next speaker is Mr. Murray Duggins. Good evening, Mr. Duggins. Uh, I hope y'all can see. Can y'all hear me? Okay. Yeah, uh, yes, sir. We can hear you fine. Okay, I'm, I'm sitting. I'm, I'm at a birthday party for my four-year-old grandchild. So, if you hear screaming, you'll know something's going on. Uh, we simply want to be in compliance. Uh, Mr. So Mr. That Duggins, can you uh, can you give us your name and, and an address? Oh, I'm sorry. Yes, sir. I'm Murray Duggins, 1107 Offshore Drive, Fayetteville, North Carolina, 28305. Thank you. All we're really asking to do, we want to be in compliance in the event we have a, a fire loss or some kind of loss. Also, our lenders would like for it to be in compliance with zoning. Uh, that's, that's all we're trying to do is just get in compliance with zoning. It's simply that, nothing else, nothing more. We've got a beautiful apartment complex there, 196 units, and uh, we've got a dog park there, uh, and we've got uh, a great clubhouse. Uh, so we're we're in the affordable housing and apartment business, and this is this is what we do every day. So this is our family-owned business, and we just want to do it right. But we do not. I'll, I'll emphasize for sure, we do not want to connect to uh, Country Club North. That would ruin our development because people would be coming through our apartment complex, going to MacArthur Road. That's the last thing we want to do. So. So that's, that's kind of where we are. So thank you. Any questions, I'll be happy to answer. Thank you, Mr. Duggins. May we have no further speakers? All right. So with that, we'll close the public hearing and do have a couple of questions. Uh, start with Council Member Waddell. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I, I think um, this, this particular development sort of is between my district and Mayor Pro Tem's district. So it will, you know, whatever decision we make is going to affect our districts jointly. Um, I'd be interested to know, I have a couple of questions, but I'd be interested to know my, my counterpart's concerns or, or any, if she has any reservations, because that will help for me to be able to make some determinations. But my two questions are, how far is the development, first of all, from the proposed sports complex site on MacArthur Road? And then secondly, what amount of land is still vacant for development that is under this consideration? Or has all of the land un been developed that we're talking about? Because as I'm thinking about it in my head, when I ride by there, I see the apartment complex and in my head, I can't see where there'd be more space for additional development, but I, I just want to um, be, be clear about that. Okay, so with that question for Mr. Duggins or Ms. Epler? Well, the question is for whichever of them can answer. And then again, I'd be interested to know, um, Mayor Pro Tem, if you have any reservations about this, being that it does abut both of our districts. And, and you know, if there is further development that will be happening, that's something that we would most certainly have to consider on behalf of our constituency. So, Mr. Duggins or Ms. Epler, uh, were you able to hear the question? Oh, okay. No. Um, yes, I was able to hear the question. Um, as far as how far this is from the proposed, um, the sports complex on MacArthur Road, staff is probably in a better position to ask, answer that question. I would say this is probably two to three miles from that location. Um, but as far as future development, there are no plans for future development for this complex right now. Now, could they develop in the future? Density, uh, yes, because the UDO zoning allowed them much more density than the old zoning did, but they have no plans to further the development in this, in this development. Okay, thank you, Ms. Epler. Um, Council Member Ingram. Thank you. Um, I can't think of your name. Could you come back up? Um, or, so I guess I'm trying to understand, um, and I hate to have to make, run you back through it. I'm just trying to understand. They're not, in, they're not, they're an existing non-conforming. Right. 
and they are needing to come. Why, why, why is the request coming again to us? I'm just trying to wrap my head around it because right now I still don't, I don't get it. Um, as an existing non-conforming use, if any of the buildings are damaged. No, I get that part. So they are trying to develop, and she just said that they're, they're not trying to. No, if any of the buildings are damaged beyond 50%. Okay. As a non-conforming non use, they would not be able to rebuild those buildings or repair them. So those individuals would lose their homes. So what they're looking to do is to become in compliance so that if anything happens to any of the buildings, they would be able to repair those buildings um, without having to come, um, without those individuals losing their homes. So they're only coming because, so to be proactive in case any yes. damages happen. And uh, when when did they become nonconforming? When the when this UDO was adopted in July of 2011. So, and I guess this goes to, goes back to staff. And I know Miss Lori, um, before I was on council, I attended quite a few of the UDO meetings, and I know Miss Lori sat on that on that task force. And I, and I just want to know, and maybe Ms. Lori can answer this because I know she's been in this business for a long time. Why, why, why is it, because I see we get a lot of nonconforming, why, why did we set, um, set these ordinances to where so many properties were now nonconforming? to where they even have to, they have to come. I would think if a UDO task force is coming together to kind of work on the benefit of the city, um, I'm just not understanding how we get so many nonconforming and the, I guess the task force efforts were to help with all that. I don't, maybe I'm confusing myself. Yeah, so I'll speak to the task force piece and then. And uh, I think that. Maybe the Maybe Doug can put it that up. They're referring to pre and Mr. Yeah, before you go, before you start, let me. Let, I think let me, I'm wording my question wrong. Why would we set an ordinance where these people couldn't even they, like they have to come and get approval to fix their properties in in that sense? So if, the, if their property got damaged, they can't fix it because they're non-conforming. Yeah. Does that 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 question make a bit, bit more sense? It does, but that is not unusual for uh, uses that were there before um, the law was so, passed. Yes. Okay. And so, and the changes that um, uh, Ms. Epler is talking about um, predate the task force that the mayor established. Right. Okay. Um, and the road specifically that um, she talks about in Country Club North is Hilliard. And okay. I think that um, for um, questions that some of you have received, if um, uh, there was a desire in the future for to connect Hilliard to Crystal Lake or, or um, I think that that would have to also come back for some further discussion as well. So, but it is as Ms. Baptiste mentioned that this is really a proactive cleanup spot okay. on behalf of the applicant. Okay, and you answered my question as to the historical of this being before that UDO. So thank you so much um, for clearing that up. Um, that's all the questions I have. And Mayor, I think for um, Council Member Waddell as well, uh, this is within walking distance of the library. Um, and so this is about a mile and a half, I would assume, from the site. Mm. Okay, thanks. Uh, before I go to Councilmember Hare, uh, Ms. Epler or, or maybe Mr. Duggins, I heard you say um, your lenders were concerned with you bringing the property into compliance. And so um, playing out a scenario a minute based on one of my colleagues' question, uh, right now as it stands, if let's say, God forbid, something happened to one of the buildings, um, and how many how many units are in in a building? Um, I I don't know if Mr. Duggins is there or not, but but I can tell you that some of the buildings there are different numbers of units in each building. For instance, two of those buildings have sixteen units in them. One building has four units. Okay. One building has one, two, three, four, five, and there are six buildings with twenty four units in a building. Right. So and our prob our problem is the SF10 only allows four units per building. No, I understand. I guess my question was, if something happens to one of these buildings and I'm a lender and now I've got 16 to 20 uh, residents that are not able 
to pay rent, then the, my whole financial model changes if I'm not able to repair this. Is that right? It does, absolutely. Okay. And so the concern that I've heard about the connectivity of, of Country Club North to this area, which you said that doesn't work within your business model, but let's let's think down the line. Is there any type of uh, – now, the manager helped out a little bit with this by saying that whatever approval of rezoning uh, does still not allow that connectivity to take place without it coming back to council, if I understood him correct. But would, would there be some other type of assurance, Mr. Duggins, that you all could provide, whether it was something – some note on the deed or anything that says that you didn't have plans to connect that road or wouldn't? Uh, can you no. hear me okay? I, I, I'm gonna be sure I'm heard, okay? Yes, sir. Okay, absolutely. We in no way want to connect Hill Drive to our property. It would it would ruin, frankly, it would ruin our property because it would probably become a thoroughfare. Well, that's the last thing. We have one entrance, we have a gated community, we have uh, swimming pools, we have clubhouses. There's no reason in the world I would want to ever connect a, a, another major development to that road. Absolutely on no conditions. And, and finally, my last question before I go to Council Member Hare, if you had available land back there based on density, I mean it's it's a money you know, it's a it's a it's a business uh, decision. If you chose or if the land accommodated additional building or to develop some other uh, structures back there. That's not based on uh, – how does that work in conjunction with you saying that you would guarantee that the, the road is not connected? So, in other well, words, I'm you could add more units to the current parcel yeah. without – What we've got back there, we've got we, – Mayor, we've got one uh, – we've got a piece of land back there that is a dog park. And I can't imagine going and telling the tenants there that we're going to take their dog park away. We'll put a bill. That would not be a, a good thing to do. So, uh, I, it, it's all downside for me if – I'm not connecting the road. I'm not taking the dog park out. I would be shooting myself in the foot if I did that. Understood. We just want to, we got a nice community, well taken care of. It's a family business and we want to do it right and we've done it right. And that's why we're asking is make sure that if one of those 16 unit buildings burn down and I can't build it back, I got a problem. Right. Because I'm paying, I'm paying the mortgage on those 16 units that can't be rebuilt. Right. Okay. And if I may, Mr. Mayor, um, at the bulb of this cul-de-sac right here, there is an eight-inch water line that runs from the bulb all the way to Hilliard Road, which is right here. Mm -hmm. There's an eight-inch water line as well as a 30-inch, I mean 30-foot utility, utility easement that runs alongside that um, water line. Parallel to this southern property line is a 30-foot gas line. Um, so they would have to, the road would have to come across these easements and cover them up, in which in talking to city staff um, for roads, they would not want to take those roadways into um, the city's system with those easements underneath them. So these, um, these, that road would have to remain private. So it really doesn't benefit the um the owner to have a um to extend that road in case anything was to happen they, it would be at their expense that that road would be torn up again I understand. okay all right thank you uh councilman here thanks mayor um very familiar with the area I, I i like that project out there it um the and it, it do, and it, it it goes out and i'm with it 100 percent that per UDO development or per UDO uh, organizing, a lot of properties had to change from a regular R type zoning to the new UDO zoning. This, we're probably going to see this even, uh, you know, some once again because there were a lot of, still a lot of properties out there that probably uh, somewhat uh, uh, non-conforming. What I wanted to know, and I thought you were going to say it, was is it would it be will the developer be open for uh, uh, attaching a condition to that for it not to be a drive-through or a connection or are we fine with where we are is that something that could be considered 
okay. even though I did hear what they just said about the, the connections, there with the gas and I think the, the water issue. Is that something that the developer would, would mind putting a stipulation in? Or is that Mr. needed? Mayor. Uh, yes. Just, just so you all understand, if this development were to ever change and Mr. Duggins would decide to add more units, that site plan would have to go through TRC approval through staff. Um, also, if they ever, if and he's already said he has no intention to, but if anyone ever tried to connect those streets, I believe, if I'm not mistaken, that the streets in Country Club North are public streets. In order to connect to that street, any developer would have to get a driveway permit from the city of Fayetteville. Okay, I better understand. This I is a straight reach. This is a straight rezoning request, and as far as I know, I don't believe you can put a condition on a straight rezoning request. Your attorney might be able to answer that for sure for you. No, ma'am. I, I withdraw my comments. Thank you. I'm with you. I understand. Thank you. All right. Uh, uh, Councilmember Waddell. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. If, if time is appropriate, I'd like to go ahead and make a motion. Okay. Uh, hold on, hold on, y'all. Let me clear lights because we had a Christmas tree up here. All right. So, Councilmember Waddell, you uh, is yes. Floor. So, for the benefit of my constituency, I do want to say one of the things that I did hear from a few people that called was this concept that this was coming before us so that more low-income housing could be built. And I would like to say that listening to all of the information that's been presented, I'm confident that the the recommendation or the motion that I'm prepared to make is an appropriate motion. Because even on the very far off chance that there was something like that that happened, we've been known around this dais and throughout this community to really have a firm belief that low income housing should be mixed in with high income housing, which is exactly what would be happening if, again, on the off chance, Mr. Duggins decided that that was the direction he wanted to go in. Um, I, I do think that in writing is always better than not, but I'm confident in moving forward and, and making a motion that we approve the map amending the rezoning to MR5. Thank you. There's a motion by Council Member Waddell. I think there's a second by Council Member uh, Mayor Pro Tem Jensen. Uh, we've discussed it. Council, I'll look to you for your votes. All right, Madam Clerk, that is unanimous. Motion carries. Thank you, Ms. Epler. Thank you, Mr. Duggins. Good luck to you. Thank you, guys. All right, Council will move to uh, item 7.02, annexation request for three properties located in Autry Lake, Gates 4 development. Ms. Baptiste, long time no see. <laughs> Good evening again. This is case number AX 20-02. The applicant is Scott Brown of 4D Solutions on behalf of the Charlene Williams Revocable Trust. The request is to um, conditionally initial, initial zoning of three properties currently zoned by Cumberland County as R7.5 residential to single family 10 conditional zoning. This case is related to case P20-24F the property is located off of Linbridge Drive and is totaling approximately 3.56 acres and is in District 6. Um, staff is recommending approval at this time. As you can see from the vicinity map, um, this prop these three properties are located right here in purple and they are located just north of Lindbridge Drive um, and to the east of Dundle Road. According to the site plan submitted um, for the, re the initial zoning case, um, these three properties will um, currently be used as a means of ingress and egress um, for the larger development that's going to be on 25.2 acres and with the possibility of future development um, sometime soon. 
you have th um, five options for tonight to adopt the ordinance with an effective date of October 26, adopt the, uh, the ordinance with an effective date of June 30th, 2021, adopt the ordinance with an effective date of June 30th, 2022, um, not to adopt the ordinance, or to table the action on the requested annexation. City staff recommends um, option one, annex the area effective October 20th, 28th, 2020, um, and establish the initial conditional, conditional zoning as single family residential 10 with the condition, um, conditional zoning, consist, consistent with prior action on the zoning case. This recommendation is based on the following. The annexation petition is sufficient the property meets the statutory standards it, as it is contiguous with the city limit lines. The ability to serve the city and PWC are able to serve the area. Um, budget impact, there should be positive impact to the city. Um, are there any questions of staff? And we also have two representatives for this item available to answer any questions as well. Uh, Ms. Baptiste, we'll catch you at the end of the uh, public, when we close the public hearing. So. Okay, thank you. Don't get too far away. I'm sure we'll have some questions. All right, with that, uh, we'll open the public hearing. Madam Clerk, you have some. Our first speaker is Mr. Scott Brown. Good evening, Mr. Brown. Good evening, sir. Can you state your address for us? Yes, yeah, Scott Brown, 409 Chicago Drive. Uh, Sweet 112, Fayetteville, North Carolina. Thank you. Uh, yes, sir, you have the floor, Mr. Brown. Uh, yes, sir, Mr. Mayor. Uh, thank you for that, and thank you, Ms. Baptiste, for the presentation. These three parcels are in conjunction with the larger parcel that was on the consent agenda uh, just a few minutes ago that was rezoned from AR to SF10. And uh, these three parcels are in the county, and in order to be served by city sewer, uh, these three parcels have to be annexed in. So we're requesting tonight that those three parcels be annexed into the city with a SF10 zoning to match the uh, current property that was just uh, rezoned with a conditional uh, rezoning per the application. Uh, Everything around it is residential. Uh, the, the remainder of the property in Gates uh, Gates Four is is in county. But again, in order to in order to get public sewer to this property, we have to annex into the city. Uh, the surrounding property to the north and to the west is also SF10. So we're in conjunction with similar properties around us. If you're not looking at any spot zoning or anything like that, it's a fairly straightforward case, and I'd be a be glad to answer any questions that the council may have of me at this time in reference to this uh, annexation and rezoning request or uh, later at the, at the end of the public hearing. Thank you, Mr. Brown. Um, Madam Clerk. Mayor, our next speaker is Mr. Palmer Williams. Mr. Williams, are you there, sir? Yes, sir, I'm here, thank you. Right. Can you hear me? Yes, sir. If you could just state your name and address for us. Yes, Palmer Williams, 2709 Thorn Grove Court, Fayetteville, North Carolina. Yes, sir. You have the floor. I don't have any comments, but I'm here on the line in case there are any questions I need to answer, but it's fairly straightforward. It'll be a private uh, gated community, kind of similar to the Gates 4, uh, that will, we have plans in the future to tie into Gates 4. So. That's the purpose for our rezoning request. Okay. Thank you, sir. So, Madam Clerk? No, we have no further speakers. All right. So with that, we'll close the public here and uh, go to Councilmember Davis. Good evening, gentlemen. Uh, for clarification, even though your intent is to maintain it as a private um, um, uh, entity, how does that interface with um, public roads and things of that nature, uh, trash, things of that nature? Um, are you saying that you're going to establish your own private community with private interest and exit and maintain your own trash and things of that nature? And I know you pay taxes. I'm just going to 
putting this out there because um, for people who are worried about Gates 4, I need you to really clarify and say, um, for the record, um, that this is annexed into the city and that you will be paying taxes and supporting the city via PwC and all the other property taxes. Yes, sir, that's correct. It'll be, with the annexation, we'll be paying the city taxes at that point and it'll get all the city services. The only, I guess the only difference with the private roads is we'll be responsible with the HOA to maintain the roads. So the city of Fayetteville won't be responsible for that. Thank you so much, gentlemen. Yes, All right. I don't uh, have any other questions, Mr. Mayor. Count, yeah, okay. Councilmember Kinston. Thank you, Mayor. I just had one question as far as um, the intentions to connect with Gates 4. Uh, for Councilmember Davis, have you heard any concerns with any residents from Gates 4? Um, I have not, ma'am. Um, and that's a great question. Gentlemen, um, since you are live on air, uh, could you please address uh, the concern raised by Councilwoman Kinston in terms of any kind of collaboration, partnership, or covenant between your property and Gates 4? Yes, sir. We've been in touch with the, the Gates 4 residents and, and the surrounding areas and kind of explained um, what our intentions are. And we've uh, been in talks with the Gates 4 HOA since early on. And I think everyone's on the same page now, and, and I haven't really heard any any pushback at this point. So uh, unless someone else has any other details to explain to the group here. Thank you very much, sir. No problem. Councilmember Kinson, was your question addressed? Yes, sir. Okay. All right. All right, Council, any other questions? If not, uh, Councilman Davis. Yes, sir. Um, if there are any other questions, Mr. Mayor, I make a motion that we approve item 7.02, annexation request for three properties located in the Archery Lake at the Gates 4 development site. All right. Council, there's a motion by Councilmember Davis. There's a second by Councilmember Hare. Uh, any further discussion? No, we've discussed it. Uh, with that, I'll look to you for your votes on the side. <laughs> Quick draw, McGraw, man. He's got fast fingers. He's a, he's a long leaf pine recipient. All right, uh, Madam Clerk, that is uh, unanimous by those. Uh, well, I'm sorry, that is eight to one. Uh, Mayor Pro Tem being uh, absent right now on break. Uh, that vote in favor of Councilman Davis, Dawkins, Banks, McLaughlin, Councilman Wright, Colvin, uh, Ingram, Hare, and Waddell. Those voting in opposition, Councilmember Kinston. What was that? I have a. I'd like to make a point of clarification, if possible. Okay. Or ask a question. In Mayor Pro Tem's absence, because do, do of. Do I need to do it before? Uh, uh, I know the vote, is, the vote is the vote, but I want to check. Yeah, let me, let me finalize that. Uh, but it's about that. It's about that, though, before you finalize it. She's a yes. Yeah. So, yeah. right. Okay. I just wanted to make sure that I understood yeah. that properly. So the clerk was going to notate that. Good point, though. Yeah. Mm -hmm. All right. That's you good? Uh -huh. All right. All right. Uh, Council, let's take a uh, few minutes break. We still have. Uh, other items under, under the eight point items. Uh, let's come back in. Can y'all make it in? Yeah, we can approve right. them others right now. Yeah, well, all right. Let's take a five minute break for those who may not be feeling good as you, GJ. And, uh, we'll be back at it in five minutes.
All right, Council, we'll call our meeting back to order. Item 8.02. Um, probably Mr. Gibson. He's just getting to work. So, how you doing, Mr. Gibson? Uh, I need your job. <laughs> uh, good evening, Council, Mayor. Uh, one of the things that uh, we've been working on so diligently with um, the City Manager and his staff um, is to get these um, agreements. Um, I don't know if uh, they're going to bring this up on the screen, but if you don't mind. What we've done is we've, br we've brought some of the um, pertinent information per agreement. I apologize, but one, one of the things that we're doing is um, the first item is 802, which is the uh, approval of the lease agreement with Methodist College to use their property. And, and, and most people know that's Jordan Soccer Complex. It's about uh, 30 to 40 acres, about um, 11 soccer fields. Uh, the improvements that we want to make out there with this agreement um, would give us um, the ability to extend our soccer programs, our football programs. Um, one of the biggest things for the Parks and Recreation Director is to um, secure the trailhead for the river trail with the parking lot and bathrooms. So this is a, a twofer um, that gives us the ability to secure that and gives us the ability to um, lease uh, another 35 acres of green space. And, and one of the things I want to make sure that we remember is in our master plan that you just approved a couple of weeks ago, that was one of the top five items that the citizens were looking for is more green space, more open space, more play space. So this moves us in the right direction. Any questions? So far, and so good, Michael. Okay, how how you, how you want me to do this? You want me to go to 803? No, I think we've got to do each one of these individual. Okay. So we'll 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 vote on 802, then move on. Uh, that that that's my um. All right. It's a presentation for 802, uh, Mayor Pro Tem. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, I would like to make a motion that we approve the lease agreement with Methodist University for the use of property on Treetop Chop Drive. Thank you. There's a motion by Mayor Pro Tem to approve item 8.02. There's a second by Council Member Hare. Can I get a question? Yeah, in the, in, in the uh, I've got a motion on the floor in a, in a second, but uh, <laughs> certainly have time for, for questions. Uh, I'll, uh, Council, I just cleared the board because of the motions. So if you have questions, Council Member Waddell, and I didn't see who the other light was, if you could please hit it if you had another question. Thank you. So um, I was pretty vocal in having some concerns about what, aside from improvements of the of the property, what, what benefit the city would be getting. We had a lot of dialogue about this. Yes, ma'am. I can appreciate the collaboration. Mm -hmm. I can appreciate all of that, but I, I want to know what has been done specifically to address those concerns as far as this agreement is concerned? Well, I, I, with, as far as this agreement, with, uh, with us being able to lease the property, mm -hmm. what it does is um, it, it adds 35 acres of play space, more soccer fields, more football fields. So your areas like Tokay, Douglas Bird, Westover, now you have more expansion we have the ability for p kids to, once we do these improvements, the lights, the bathroom, the parking lot, now we can expand the northern side of, nor of Fayetteville to stay on your side of town. So are these going to be public play spaces where John Q. Public can take his family for the day and they can go play on the field? Yes, ma'am. Or you can stay in your community because nobody else is coming over there. And you won't need to reserve them through any special process they will just be open for public use well now you still have to come to us just like any of our soccer fields or complexes because we will schedule practices 
So you still have to, now you can go out there if it's open, it's open. But if somebody comes up and says, oh, well, I've scheduled my practice, then you have to move just like any of our other facilities. And the last part of my question, what agreement have we come to with the Fayetteville Soccer Club? Because I know that they were able to utilize the yes, space for zero dollars or was it one dollar for their lease? I, I, I'm not privy to what they were, what Methodist College had worked out with them, but the manager has an agreement that on his desk now that if they choose to, they will be paying us um, what I believe a decent amount of money per Are year. you at liberty to disclose what a decent amount of money is to this council, or is that something that we just have to kind of infer? No, ma'am. Um, that, that agreement probably will come to council, or you will be in an um, administrative report making sure you understand, just like any of our agreements, um, especially when there's money involved you will definitely be in, uh, informed. Yeah, and that was one of my biggest concerns, Mr. Gibson. And so if, you, if you'd like to jot it down on a piece of paper so I can have some, some assurance that my, my concern has been addressed. Because if, if you all will remember, Council, I looked at this deal and I said, okay, we're, asking, we're being asked to put up this amount of money. And it was a negotiating, almost like a negotiating war. And I said, well, what are we going to get out of it? Because the, it was already being utilized. Aside from the usage and the partnership, what are we going to get out of it? And so until that's – and I want to like this deal. Mm -hmm. I really do. I want to like it. But I, I, need, I need to know, aside from upfitting the fields – and I hear you when you say we're getting this extra space. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. But what are we – because we're not going to own it. We're leasing it. The terms changed midway. And I was very specific in, hey, these are my concerns. But if we don't have the, it's hard to breathe behind this mask. But if we don't have the answers to that th tonight, then <clears throat> that's fine. I'll just have to make my decision based upon that. But if you do have some of those, you know, if you can ha answer some of my concerns, even if you do so by just, like I said, jotting something down and saying. There, there, there is a, if the, uh, if the manager approves the, uh, the uh, agreement with the soccer association, there is a monetary value to that agreement. But okay. we are still, I think, uh, Council Member Waddell, part of the challenge uh, here was that we needed to get the lease with the Methodists worked out and approved. Once we get that, then we will be able to continue our negotiations with the soccer club as it relates to them being a sub uh, leasey tenant of of the complex and so I hear what you're saying right because my concern is like are we talking a dollar are we talking five hundred dollars because we talking just about more than that y'all can still jot it down and hand it to me but I'll, I'll <laughs> I'm gonna go with what you're saying okay thank you all right council member Ingram thank thank you mayor um so did I hear you say eight fields or 11 fields? It, it, it all depends on how you, when, you, when you're doing soccer, mm -hmm. depending on the age group, um, how you can cut the fields up, but there's 35 acres. So we not come up, I thought we had a plan, a layout, so we won't know until we start to construct or no, get no, the design no. in place. I, I, I think you're asking me two questions. I think you might be asking me a question of how many fields we're going to light versus how many fields we'll have access to. Yes, access. Let's start with access. We'll have access to roughly 11 fields, depending on how you mark them. How, we, how many we lighten? Eight. And how many total overall? 11. Okay. And then, so when I'm looking at this approval of lease agreement, we're approving the lease agreement, but we don't know how much we're paying. No, ma'am. No, ma'am. It's right there. It's That's right. Sure. Okay. So, 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 I guess we're paying. We're paying an amount to Methodist. Mm -hmm. Council Member Waddell's question was, how much will the soccer club yes. be paying yes. to the so city that, of Fayetteville? That's, that's what I'm trying to get to. So, why don't we know that right now? Because we needed to get this lease approved okay. before we could negotiate with the soccer club for their agreement with the city. Mm, okay, thank you. All right, Councilman, we have uh, also on the floor has been seconded, uh, motion by Mayor Pro Tem, seconded by Council Member Hare. 
We've discussed it. I look to you for your votes on item 8.02. All right, Adam Clark, that is unanimous. Thank you, Council. Mr. Carries. All right, Mr. Gibson, item 8.03. Uh, this is a, a, a memorandum of understanding with Favel State. Um, I'm, I'm sure that um, uh, this has been batted around for the public the last year. It is an agreement um, to co-locate the Wellness Center, a $5.5 million facility for the university and our Senior Citizen East, which is another $5.5 million um, item in the bond to co-locate on about 10 acres that runs Merkerson Road, Washington Drive, and Filter Plant. Um, this agreement gives us the opportunity for site development um, to share in the cost of that, uh, getting the area, to share in the parking lot, um, to share in the whole site of the 10 acres. Um, I think if, if, if council sees this the way that I see it, I think this is probably one of the, um, the steps that when you talk about corridor redevelopment, corridor um, um, uh, change, this is a game changer um, because you now take an area that has been blighted for probably about 30 years and you turn it into an $11 million project um, that, that matches what you see in some of our sister cities that we compete against um, and gives the starts to change why you want to live in that environment um, and starts to move people uh, to surround that area. Um, so I think this is a game changer. Um, we've been working with Fable State as we've been working just like Methodist College. Uh, one of the things the managers said to us completely is partnerships. Um, as well as being on budget on time. Um, but the partnership here is another one that um, we look favorably on and uh, hope you see it the same way. Thanks so much, Ms. Gibson. Um, did have uh, Light, Mayor Pro Tem, and uh, Mr. Hare, and then Ms. Ingram. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I would like to make a motion to approve the amendment for, to the Senior Center East Memorandum of Understanding with Fayetteville University, Fayetteville State University. All right. Excuse me, Mayor. Yes, sir. I thank you. We were with you. But it would really be dear to our hearts if you would let Miss Ingram make that and let me second okay. it. Please, please. I, I understand that, but Mr. <laughs> Councilmember Hare, I have worked for three years have. on this, and um, if that is the will of you, I'll be more than happy to give it to you because yeah. it's your night, but um, I do want to let you know that um, a lot of people haven't made this easy for me, so right. I, I will yes. hand it over to you two. Thank you. You know, you can third it. Well, well what we need to do is... Uh, <laughs> M Madam uh, Attorney, what we have to do, we draw that motion and then do it again. All right. So, glad, guys, I'm glad y'all are eager to get involved in this. I need to withdraw the first motion and then whatever uh, your pleasure is on the second. Yeah. And, and really, it's, you, it's, you've it's, got it's just a, a passion. We all I support I withdraw it. my motion. Okay. Um, yes, I would like to make a motion that we approve the amendment for uh, to the Senior Center East Memorandum of Understanding with Fever State University. And I proudly second. All right. There's a motion by Thank uh, you, Mayor Council Pro Member Harris. There's a second by Council Member Ingram. Any discussion on the motion? Are y'all voting or questions? Question. Oh, that's what I'm talking about. All right, Council. Uh, we'll look to you for your votes. Uh, Council Member Kinston, hit yours again. You were faster than me on that. All right. All right, Madam Clerk, that's unanimous. Motion carries. Good job, guys. Good job, uh, uh, Mayor Pro Tem, Councilman Wright, and others on the uh, Partial Rec Bond Committee. Uh, we still good, got another very, very item to go. Very good job. Thanks item, so much. All right, Michael, don't get lost. Item 8.04. Uh, here we go. This is the uh, Memorandum of Understanding with Fort Bragg on the uh, 70 acres on MacArthur Road for a license agreement. Um, to, to move that forward through the uh, channels of Fort Bragg and Defense Department. Um, 
This is a five-year license agreement to improve the property. Um, of the 70 acres, if you look in your um, packet, there's probably only about 35 acres that we'll be improving based on the budget we have, and that would get us a wagon wheel and a half uh, with the supporting um, infrastructure, parking lot, bathroom, storm water, um, lights for the, for the uh, baseball fields, uh, and some concrete pads. Thank you, Ms. Gibson. Mr. Wright, Councilman Wright. Mr. Mayor, I'd like to make a motion to authorize the city manager to execute the proposed MOA uh, amendments with Fort Bragg to develop the MacArthur Road Sports Complex and to take all necessary uh, actions to implement that agreement. All right, as a uh, motion by Council Member Wright, Mr. Davis, uh, so, okay, I'm coming. Mr. Davis, was that a second? All right, as a, as a motion uh, by Council Member Wright, a second by Council Member Davis, and discussion, Council Member Waddell. Thank you, sir. I actually have a process question. Typically, when, when we're going through these, um, through these items, you will stop us and say we haven't had questions yet before you entertain the motion in the second. As has that is that process changing or? Well, Ben, we've probably had six or seven meetings about this. Uh, I didn't think it was necessary to do it. And okay, I, had I just of, wanted to kind of clarify right. that, so that it was, process. Right, so that's a little different tonight that since been it's been discussed. Okay, so my, I, my question is, um, I looked through this, this, and one of the things that I noticed, again, is that we are primarily responsible for the maintenance and upkeep. Can you give some indication as to what the estimated cost in personnel and maintenance annually would be for this particular location? Well, if you if you look at what we normally do, we have a couple of facilities that are multi multi use mm -hmm. that are wagon wheeled from Douglas Bird over to um, Tokay. Oh, even College Lakes has three fields in its site. So and they're roughly they run roughly around 17, 18 acres. This one would be a little bit bigger. Mm -hmm. um, so if you just look in manpower, you're talking about an equipment operator uh, and then a crew of about three or four that do, that would be doing all the trimming. Um, but it's just open field. It's just, mm -hmm. and we, we normally use one tractor. So I would say probably about sixty to $70,000 a year okay. to maintain it. Thank you. Uh, well, Council Member Kinston? Yes, Mayor. I have one question. Um, in looking at the information and after we've had several meetings, one of the things that stuck out, and I just wanted to make sure where it talks about the maintenance as well, is as far as uh, police security as well. Is that something that's joined? Is that going to be completely on the city? Well, I, I mean, one, once it becomes property of the city, then we have a comp. We normally have a conversation with our police department. Sometimes we do a little something with the sheriff department, but it would be no no different than when we have all of our other major facilities, like a Magic Park, um, Festival Park is one, another one that we would have that they would do the patrolling just like they do any of our other major facilities. But I don't know if, if I answered it, that there there's some conversation about something special. I'm not sure. You answered it. Thank okay. you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, before I go to Council Member Ingram, Mr. Gibson, how much is Fort Bragg charging us for this land? Z <laughs> well, we don't know yet. How much, is, how much have they said they were going to charge us for the land? It will likely have a license fee, but we don't know that yet. Um, but it is um, will likely again be negligible, and we will find out more. As in not much. Oh. We will um, uh, find out more as part of our due diligence how this works. Um, you, your request tonight will be forwarded if, if adopted. Uh, approved will go to Fort Bragg. Fort Bragg will run it through their internal processes, which will include. Um, the Corps of Engineers, as it is federal property, and they'll look at everything from the red cockaded woodpecker to the star nose vole mm -hmm. and Venus flytrap and everything else to make sure that we are not endangering the, um, the environment. Um, that could right. take several months to run through. Um, and during that process, we will be asking them, I think this Friday, Friday um, to uh, confirm with us what the negligible amount will be. But if it is a, a lease amount, very similar to what we have done with Methodist, with your approval, we have the funds to pay uh, that as well. But we do not expect it to be in the range of 
of like 90 acres would cost us? No, that's, you know, no, we don't, don't think it would be that. But we will know more of this end of this week. All right. Councilmember Ingram. Thank you, Mayor. I will say one of the things I noticed about this property is that um, it houses currently, I believe, longleaf pine trees. Um, I did that. I found that out through research. Um, <clears throat> City Manager, thank you for um, walking through that process. I want to ask a quick question, or guess a few, before I make a statement. Um, through this process, as we send this up, it is potential that it could come back uh, with changes or denial? Changes? Yes, or denial? Yeah, yes, ma'am, it, okay. it, it could. Um, we were, um, this is the process that uh, Fort Bragg indicated they would, uh, would would prefer, like but you were correct, it could come back with modifications or denial. We, that's, okay. We're making a request for a license. And we will be leasing, not owning? Yes, ma'am, okay. we will have a license, we will not own. And in terms of security, um, has that been an extensive conversation as far as, because the way I look at it, um, due to social unrest and, um, you know, people using public property to uh, do whatever, or pop up co community cookouts, however you may have it, due to this being military property, how does that work with, um, this this technically won't be public property, will it? We will have, a, you're correct, in, in that we will have a license to do certain things. And if there were um, uh, some heinous crime or something there, it likely would be investigated and possibly could even be charged by, by the military since it is federal property. Okay. Um, it would be subject to all of our other facilities that it would be open um, at uh, you know, at dawn and closed at dusk, unless, of course, we were having a tournament. Um, given the number of fields that we would have there, uh, we would have eyes on it. It is um, a fairly well-traveled corridor, which is one of the reasons that was attractive for this site. Um, but those are some of the use elements that um, we would look at with um, any facility, uh, making sure we did have adequate eyes on it. But you are correct, it being a military or federal property, um, depending on what activity was happening there, um, if it was criminal in nature, um, if it was not consistent with the license that we are seeking to be granted, it would not be permitted. Thank you, City Manager. My final question before I make my state and statement. Mayor Pro Tem, as you chaired the Parks and Rec Barn Committee, um, first question, did, did uh, I guess citizens from the community sit on this board? Sorry, are you talking about the Parks and Rec Bond Committee? Yes. No, ma'am. That was all city council members. Okay. Um, what input besides the public voting did they have on these projects? The public, um, our residents voted. I said besides voting. Besides voting? Mm -hmm. um, I know that I have been to the neighborhood watch around that area, and they are very excited about it, the people that live around that area. So to give you a little history of how this um, land came to fruition, I, I think, is um, I've been on council for seven years, and the first year I got on council, I got numerous amounts of phone calls of litter, and trash and loitering and what could we do to fix that and we had no jurisdiction we couldn't do anything so we we started the conversation with the military saying you know we have this we have that what can we do about it and it went back and forth for years and years and I mean, to be honest with you, I think at one point they said, well, what are we going to do with this land? Because it, it just keeps getting more and more, and with especially with 295. And again, the military came to us and said, we have this 90 acres of land. This is what can be put on it. What do you think? Thank so you. it started off with that. So okay. that's how it happened. Thank you. And as I wrap up, I will say I'm not prepared to really support this. And I'm glad Council Member um, Mayor Pro Tem Jensen gave us a brief history of how this came about. Um, as I researched very extensively, I learned that um, the sports complex was proposed for east of the river. 
um, we learned that Fields Road was not necessarily a viable site. However, um, they were they were promised some 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 things for their vote. And what I've learned is we've taken projects from them to give to another community. And I don't think that's I don't think that's just and I don't think that's fair. And I know everything in this life isn't fair. But when you are taking from one community to support another, that is not just. All communities have blight issues. All communities have um, crime issues. And East of the River has been advocating for development and investment for longer than I've been alive. And to say, I went to a community watch in that community that's not East of the River and give them a project, I, don't, I just don't think that's just. So thank you. Okay. Councilman Davis. Um, Mr. Mayor, I just want to say for all the listening audience out there, um, that this process does not involve just one council member, that there are 10 council members on this board, on this diocese. And I believe if Mr. Gibson was invited to come back and just simply tell us what percentage of the total parks and rec bond has been invested into District 2, you would be shocked to know there's almost 60%. Um, there's so many other places in the city um, that have um, not yet had a dime of the Parks and Rec bond invested in it that I think we've got to continue to press forward, um, but I don't think it helps us to disparage or to say to one community that one specific person took money to give to another community. It doesn't represent council uh, as it was done at the time. I wasn't on it. Councilwoman Ingram wasn't on it. And it doesn't represent the heart of our city or the intent of the leadership of the city, which I'm a part of. So I take issue with that comment and that statement. It doesn't make us um, better. It divides us. And I hope that we can move forward and vote and um, deliver what we promised uh, to the constituents. Thank you. Councilman Dawkins. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, city manager mentioned eyes on the complex or eyes on the field. And Mr. Gibson, I, I need some assurance that you're going to work with the, Fort, the U.S. Army folks uh, because what the city manager brought up uh, is so important. We want to re we want to do all we can to reduce crime in all of our parks and recreation centers. And and do you plan on suggesting cameras be on on these fields or cameras be installed on this on this complex? And if so, will it be the U.S. Army's responsibility uh, to monitor those cameras, or is it or is uh, it would be part of our parks and rec system? that we monitor it, it would be part of parks and recreation if any if any cameras went out there um, as we have in many of our parks um, it would be monitored by parks and recreation and you said if any cameras go out there I, I just would like some assurance that we're planning on proposing cameras on on these fields yes, because sir. this we, is a we can huge add that to the design all right thank you mr gibson thank you mr mayor thank you uh second round councilwoman ingram Yes, Mayor. And, you know, Councilmember Davis, you've made up some great points. And I just want to make you aware that I'm fully aware that um, District 2 has the most uh, parklands and recreational activity in this district. And as I stated to City Manager Mr. Gibson and Dr. Whitfield numerous times, when we look at the investment, um, not all the time it's equitable investment. I've even advocated for your district to get a rec center as well as I went to Dish Douglas Bird, and I believe those, do, those children need, need that. Um, so when I talk about moving things, I'm talking about equitabil equitability amongst this district. Um, but I'm glad you point that out, pointed that out, and I thank you. But I just wanted to make it clear, I'm aware of how much I have in this district and how many dollars that, that, that have been allocated for this district. Thank you. Thank you, Councilman Ingram. Tonight's discussion that's before us is about the MOU with Fort Bragg at MacArthur Road. So uh, I know that we've, you know, as I alluded to earlier, we've had several meetings about this, and I, I think that as we focus on this, what's before us tonight is uh, to authorize the city manager to execute an agreement with Fort Bragg for that site. Uh, we've received science reports that this project would not work at that location. So now we, we are here where we are tonight. Council, we've had extensive uh, discussion on it. It's time to vote.
Sonra ne demek için? Council Member Kinston. All right, Madam Clerk, that motion carries seven to three. Those voting in favor, Councilman Davis, Dawkins, Wright, Colvin, Jensen, Hare, and Kinston. Those voting in opposition, Councilmember Banks, McLaughlin, Ingram, and Waddell. All right, uh, Mr. Gibson, item 8.05. Uh, this is the uh, tennis center we had uh, brought to you a couple of weeks ago. Um, with that concept plan to go in Masaryk 3, which is off of Filter Plant Drive um, and at the corner of Filter Plant and um, Bragg Boulevard. There's about 14 acres in there, um, and what we're proposing is a eight to 10,000 square foot uh, tennis center with about 10 hard courts, six clay courts, four pickleball courts, um, and some green space. Um, the, that concept plan, and we're looking for that approval uh, from council tonight um, so that we can go ahead and move forward with the USA Tennis Association and our um, construction management division. Thank you, Ms. Gibson. Uh, Mayor Pro Tem Jensen. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I would like to make the motion that we approve the tennis center at Masaryk, the conceptual design approval for the tennis center at Masaryk Park. All right, there's a motion by Mayor Pro Tem Jensen. There was a second by Council Member Dawkins. Uh, any discussion on the motion, Council? Uh, Mr. Hare, are you voting or discussing? Voting, sir. All right. All right, Council, I'll look to you for your votes. All right, Madam Clerk, that motion carries 9 to 1. Um, Mr. Mayor, I just want to thank Count, Council Member Hare for letting me be the second on that i know he's worked mighty hard on this project <laughs> in that area but i appreciate him deferring to let me he's, second he's got fast thumbs mr <laughs> Duncan. all right i appreciate everything favor. council uh, uh councilman davis dawkins banks mclaughlin wright colvin jensen hare kinston and waddell those voting in opposition council member ingram all right and item 8.06 is that you sir no, it will be presented by um, uh, Assistant Manager Angel Wright Lanier. Is she on? Yes, I am. Good afternoon, Mayor and Council. How are you? Good afternoon. I want to introduce Chase McDowell, uh, Chess McDowell, and the folks from Kilpatrick Townsend, our state lobbyist, our state lobbying group. They have worked with us to put together our first um, state legislative agenda, and they will do. They will present that now. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. Thank you, Angel. Uh, can everybody hear me okay? Yes, sir. Yeah. Good deal. Um, are are, are y'all gonna put the agenda on the screen? <laughs> Jennifer. Um, or someone there, can we get the agenda up on the screen, please? They're working it now. Ms. Wright Lanier, what's the name of the, the document? The state legislative agenda. It should be, if you go to the online version of the agenda, it's listed. Got it. You going to share it? State action plan. Sure. Jennifer is pulling it up now, ma'am. You may need to hey. enlarge. Very good. Well, that's coming up. I'll introduce, uh, introduce my team. Uh, we came and, uh, and presented to you all a couple months ago, uh, but uh, my team includes uh, John Easterling, Amanda Donovan, Nelson Freeman, Hampton Billups. You have all of us, uh, all of us here tonight, and 
we appreciate the uh, the opportunity to represent you all, and uh, we've enjoyed coming up with this coming up with this agenda, and hopefully have uh, have a lot of progress in the next legislative session. Uh, can somebody click to the next slide? All right, so we've broken our agenda down into a couple of categories. After meeting with with uh, most, if not all, of you all to to, to understand the issues that are important to you. Uh, combining that with our knowledge of uh, the legislative process and the, the folks who are uh, in positions of power at the legislature right now, uh, we came up with, with these, uh, these ideas. Some of these things are, and we'll talk about each of them as we go through, but some of, the, some of these things are, are things that um, hopefully we'll be able to get movement on in the next legislative session. Some of these things are long-term goals. Uh, so uh, each, each item is a little bit different in how we'll need to work that. Uh, but uh, we, will, we will absolutely make more progress than, than there is this year without a legislative agenda. Uh, <clears throat> so first, economic development, uh, support efforts to enhance local control of occupancy and beverage revenues. Uh, this, this is a, a provision that a number of cities uh, are interested in and something that will go uh, with the League of Municipalities, Metro Mayors and, and other municipalities to work on, on this particular issue. This is one of those things that's gonna be a be a long-term, long-term effort, uh, but something that we think we can make uh, make some progress on. Uh, Sport for Restoration and Annexation Authority. Uh, this has uh, a, a, been a big sticking point over the last ten years of uh, the Republicans controlling the legislature, and this is something that will will certainly take a uh, will certainly a long-term goal, but something that again is important to a number of municipalities and and other local governments and uh, oppose legislation that would change the distribution of local sales tax. Uh, this is an issue that's kind of been perennial the legislature the last 10 years uh, where the legislature has attempted to redistribute um, local sales taxes uh, from larger municipalities, larger cities in favor of smaller counties. Um, the argument uh, against that is that uh, you know, we, we shouldn't we shouldn't punish Cumberland County or the city of Fayetteville for being successful, but instead a rising tide rises all boats, and uh, and we'll continue to push that uh, push that narrative. We worked on this issue for a number of years for the city of Charlotte and the Metro Mayors. Next slide. Transit. Um, so transit is obviously something that's uh, very important to uh, to the city of Fayetteville and uh, and to a number of other cities. It's also something that tends to only impact uh, large cities. Uh, so uh, the makeup of the General Assembly is crucial on, on how the funding for transit breaks down. <clears throat> uh, over the last uh, the last budget cycle, the state maintenance assistant program was cut. Uh, it was a, it was actually cut uh, two budget cycles ago. We were able to get that funding restored uh, on behalf of the city of Charlotte, but uh, it, it did not survive the, the COVID cuts, so to speak. Um, and we will work to restore those funds. I, I've uh, we've already been working on this a little bit. I, I think we're um, <clears throat> it's it's fairly promising that that money uh, could be found or to replace uh, the cut from this year. Also, uh, seek. DOT funding to support the current transit and transportation program you all have, uh, essentially just adding more eyes to, uh, to to look for available dollars that can come to the city. Support restoring the airport improvement program uh, to its original fund, to its full funding. And uh, this was something that a, a, a number of you mentioned uh, was the support for the airport and uh, how critical the airport improvement program has been to the success of the airport over the last number of years. <clears throat> Again, that was uh, that that program was uh, was fully funded for about three three or four budget cycles or three or four years, and then uh, was cut uh, during COVID. Uh, fortunately, the cut did not impact the city of Fayetteville. Uh, it only impacted uh, about three airports. <clears throat> but restoring that program to its full potential will be will be beneficial to the city because uh, once that program is fully funded again, we can we can work on increasing. Uh, that that overall pot of money, support restoring power distribution and oppose uh, efforts to cut funding. This is another kind of hot topic that's been been fairly perennial. About two years ago, again, the legislature attempted to cut the power bill distribution for Raleigh and Charlotte. And although that would not impact the city of Fayetteville, once you cut Raleigh and Charlotte, you can pretty quickly figure out who's going to be next on the chopping block. 
and uh, so uh, this last budget cycle, Raleigh and Charlotte were also cut again, kind of cut cuts, and hopefully uh, we'll be able to restore that money and restore all power bill funding and oppose all future cuts. Next slide. Water and sewer. Um, identifying seek DEQ funding opportunities for, to support stormwater infrastructure. Uh, th this is kind of uh, to expand on this a little bit uh, outside of DEQ. Um, God forbid there's another Hurricane Matthew type situation in fact, Well, there was a, a lot of money that was left on the table uh, with, with, with those type of federal funding. And um, <clears throat> we'll work to, to continue to, to help you all improve your water and sewer system and, and find funding opportunities where we can. Street maintenance again. This was something that was important to a number of you when, when we uh, when we had our discussions. Um, but seek DOT funding to support sidewalk maintenance, repairs, and resurfacing. Again, this is this is one of those issues that really only impacts cities. Um, rural areas and counties don't really have sidewalk uh, budgets. But um, <clears throat> working with DOT and the legislature to find opportunities to support funding for that will will certainly be another priority. Uh, broadband, um, of course, will support efforts to expand the, enhance the city's broadband infrastructure. This is uh, an issue that has been at the General Assembly for, for a number of years, really, really, I guess, about five or six years since broadband's really become a thing. Um, and there's a number of folks that uh, have, have taken this as a major cause of theirs. This is a good opportunity, too, for us to work with rural areas and find something that we can uh, be collaborative with, whether it be the, the Cumberland County, uh, or the entire delegation of Cumberland County, whether it be, you know, Hoke or Scotland or, or a, another rural county, this is a good opportunity for us to work together to increase the statewide infrastructure, but uh, something that's important and, uh, and, and, and increasingly more important as, uh, as technology continues to expand. Emergency planning. Again, uh, funding opportunities from the Office of Recovery and Resiliency to support uh, hurricane and flood uh, issues and, and making sure that um, things that happen in Hurricane Matthew, uh, you have better, uh, better preparedness to handle those things. <clears throat> and one thing that a no number of other municipalities have worked on, but it's particularly important for you all based on your geographic location, is North Carolina search and rescue teams and supporting uh, efforts to sustain funding for those. Uh, you all are in a much different situation than <clears throat> Asheville or uh, <clears throat> or Concord with uh, search and rescue teams. So we'll continue to uh, work and uh, increase funding for that. Quality of life, uh, the, the broadest of the categories. Uh, of course, affordable housing is something that was important to a, to a number of you all and, and a, an issue that is important to a number of municipalities and something that continues to, um, to, to, to be more and more important as, as kind of the, the rural urban uh, divide continues to increase and the, you know, the wealth gaps increase within a city um, as uh, obviously as the city of Fayetteville continues to grow and continues to build, affordable housing is going to continue to be an issue and uh, something that I think uh, a number of folks at the legislature have a, have a desire to address. Uh, also an issue we'll work with a number of other municipalities on. Uh, local control of outdoor advertising is another one of those perennial issues that, that comes up at the General Assembly. The outdoor advertisers have a, a pretty impressive uh, lobbying effort and you know, they only have one thing to worry about. It's, it's always when you think about who you're up against on certain issues, <clears throat> Outdoor advertisers have one issue, and that is outdoor advertising. The city of Fayetteville has a number of issues, uh, and, and so they, they're able to spend a lot more political capital and a lot more bandwidth working on passing that bill. Uh, fortunately, they haven't been able to do it for the last decade, and, and we'll continue to uh, continue to fight those as they come up. Support efforts to preserve local control of short-term rentals. Uh, this is an issue that, that popped up about two years ago, well, two or three years ago, as Airbnb continued to, uh, to or came onto the scene and now continues to grow. Fable doesn't have the same issues that Wilmington or Asheville has with these short-term rentals, uh, but it, uh, it, it is going to be an issue that is important to preserve local control uh, where you don't have residential areas turning into hotels and hostels. And so as, uh, as those issues continue to pop up, we'll 
we'll work on those. We were successful in beating down a, a big attempt by Airbnb a number of years ago to <clears throat> really take away all local control of the issues. So uh, something we'll continue to monitor. We'll oppose the legislation that places limitation on local government regulations concerning tree removal. Another issue that's kind of popped up in, in recent years um, where uh, local control on, on these type of issues is critically important. We'll work to, um, to maintain that. <clears throat> if this is one of those things where it's, it, it's clearly better for people in the city of Fayetteville to make these decisions than people in Raleigh. Identify and seek funding opportunities for the land and water conservation fund for outdoor recreational needs. Um, something that, that's important to a, to a number of municipalities, but uh, especially you all in the, the Cape Fear Basin and um, opportunities that you all have that other municipalities may not have, we'll continue to work on uh, seeking those funding opportunities. And public safety, um, incredibly hot topic at the moment and something that I fully expect there to be some legislation on next year, regardless of who's in control of the General Assembly. And uh, we'll support additional funding on any public safety matter and efforts to preserve local control of the pension system. That's another one of those perennial issues that comes up every year where um, outside groups attempt to to put mandates on local government pension systems and uh, something that has been a long, hard fought battle every year and something we'll continue to continue to work on and continue to push. I think that uh, I think that's everything that um, any questions on any of those individually or? Uh, we do have a few lights here. I'll go to city manager and then I'll go to uh, Councilman Dawkins and Waddell. Yes, okay. Um, thank you, um, Chess and Angel as well. Um, before we um, get off, if you guys could again reiterate when council takes the action tonight, um, what you're going to do next. But Mayor, this would be an appropriate time if there are any items that we have not collected for you to make us so, uh, aware of those. Um, um, because one of the things about it, um, when they're up in, in Raleigh or talking to folks, you never know when an opportunity might present itself for them to slip something in. And I think that there might be some interest in doing that. So um, Chess, if, um, if y'all are open to take some additional items well, as well. Well, Mr. Manager, normally yes. when, we, when we are doing this we the council has an opportunity to talk about what we prioritize i don't, I don't know if it's going to be when it those guys don't come back in session in january we usually have our legislative uh meeting then um i mean i i don't want us just throwing stuff off the cuff if it's not a council will it may be just a individual mm -hmm. initiative so correct now w specifically i had an interest um from a uh, few about something like ramp the rent um, uh, residential action management rental action management program which was um, disabled by the General Assembly several years ago. So yeah, that that made our our list. Yes, uh, so those previous council, but but again, to put some clarity around the process, um, can you pull him back up, Mr. Chess? Sir, when is your um, when can the council have a have an opportunity to have a meeting to get you some additional items in case there's something we forgot? But I think it's something that important as a legislative change needs a little more thought put into it than coming at the end of the meeting tonight. What, what's your cutoff time for uh, getting items up there to you? We'd probably like to have every uh, all of our ducks in a row about by December 1st. Um, once we have a little better idea of what the legislature looks like, we may have a little better idea of uh, the likelihood of success of certain things. But I will say that to the legislative agenda, uh, although these are kind of the, the structured uh, stated priorities of the city, there will be a number of issues that come up that we hadn't even contemplated. Right. Uh, for example, two years ago, the Airbnb issue is, is, not, is something that no one had thought about and was not on any legislative agendas, but all of a sudden it was something that the, the cities had to take action on. Um, so I'd consider this somewhat of a, a living document uh, that, uh, that as issues pop up, we can continue to, to add and tweak um, but I'd say, uh, you know, about December 1st gives us a 30 day runway to, to lay the groundwork with the, the delegation, whether they be the same people they are now or a couple, a couple of changes. Um, <clears throat> that, that will give us plenty of time to, to set the groundwork going into the legislative session in January. So maybe sometime, uh, Council, uh, in the coming, you know, weeks, maybe we can put together a meeting that, that we can give some real solid thought to, uh, 
some things we can get them to advocate for. But it's just a thought. All right. I do have a couple of uh, other questions for you, Councilman Dawkins. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, thank you, Chaz. Thank you, Assistant City Manager Wright here. Chaz, we need 45 days, so make it December 15th so we can have uh, our uh, December work session. Uh, this is very important, um, and Council Lady Kinston and I want to, want to discuss and have the Council consider the red light camera addition, which the legislature would have to approve. Uh, plus, I need time to convince the legal municipalities that they need to support this, Chaz. What's happening is the schools get all the revenue after expenses for the red lights, and that's fine. We can continue that. And, uh, and we can even look at, you know, increases over time. But what we're after is money that we can use as a city to be able, above what the rate now, maybe it's $100, and maybe we go to a buck 25 or a buck 30 for red light runners. But what's happening, folks are running red lights, accidents in Fayetteville increasing. We have no money to improve these intersections. So that's something we want to talk about. Thank you for putting in there about annexation. But what I want to suggest, Chaz, is that whatever happens with the legislature, we need to meet with the Speaker of the House and, the, and whatever caucus is in charge of the House so that five or six of us can go up there and explain Fayetteville's annexation. Um, most of the legislators I've talked to, including some of our local legislators, they have no idea that Fayetteville was not allowed to annex for over 25 years and, and what it's done to us. We've got some solutions because we need to do something about Shaw Heights and we need to do something about the donut holes that are in areas of the city where you have folks getting city water and city sewer but not paying city taxes. So. Um, I'm, I'm thrilled you want to talk about the annexation, but we want to talk specifically about a bill that would be attached to one bill that's really moving, and we got to make sure folks on the Dem side and folks on the Repub side understand why we're asking this. And that means a meeting with the head of the Republican caucus, the head of the Democratic caucus, and, and the Speaker of the House. Uh, so I want to make you aware of that. Okay, lastly, uh, towns and cities are going broke. I'm, you're probably aware of that because of the water and sewer issue. Dale Falwell, the treasurer, has taken over four or five towns and already a couple of cities. Uh, so I wanted to, to mention that, um, that, that we make sure we have protections for towns and cities with their water uh, and their sewer. And then lastly, thank you for bringing up about the STRs. Um, the county here gets all the revenue. The city gets zero. That's not true across the state of North Carolina, um, whereas most cities get a portion of the hotel motel tax. We get zero. And thank you for putting in there about the sales tax. We need to make sure that the city is not frozen out on uh, prepared food tax, uh, beverage tax, and ABC tax. So. I throw a lot at you, but if I recall, uh, you're an NC State man, and you've got some UNC people on there. So you've no, got sir. both no, sides no, covered. No, no. no, sir, we don't have any UNC people. Oh. Hey, Y'all were doing good. <laughs> Way to go. Y'all were doing good, guys. <laughs> thank, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you, Chess. I might have to go red now. <laughs> All right. Um, Council Member Waddell. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I'm interested in finding out from, <clears throat> I guess, our council and our lobbyists, when we look at public safety, one of the conversations that's happening around the state of North Carolina is what involvement our General Assembly needs to have in helping to bring to pass some action for the citizens who are asking for a citizen review board. As we all know, that's completely out of our hand, a lot of what they're asking for. And so I wonder if this should also be an item that comes before our lobbyists to be able to have this dialogue at the state level, particularly since it's not only something that we're talking about here in our municipality, but across the state of North Carolina and several other municipalities, this has been a very hot topic of conversation. And so um, that, along with some other items that I will very likely um, be kind of reaching out prior to our next meeting about this topic. But since we'll be having another meeting about this, are we going to be required to vote on this tonight or are we going to table this until after we make sure that it meets the complete objective of this council? I think maybe um, we can consider receiving the report and put in the motion that 
uh, there are more items forthcoming. What did you guys need from us exactly? Uh, so, Mayor, there's a couple ways that you could do that. You could approve it as requested, and then we could amend it. Mm -hmm. And so you've, you've stated your interest. Um, Chess and, uh, and his team, I think, met individually with all of you or, or tried to, to try to develop this. And so, or if you would like, uh, I'm not sure what the agenda for November 2nd looks like or their availability, but um, we might be able, if not November 2nd, then definitely the December work session, we could get that on um, as an item. Uh, but it's your pleasure. You could receive it tonight, <laughs> adopt and amend, it's your choice. I would, uh, I'm sorry, I, my, my computer battery died, I'm back on my phone, um, but I, I would uh, I would probably advise uh, December just because that gives us a little bit of time after the election, and uh, depending on who is in the delegation and who are in the majority parties, that could change uh, some likelihood on, on a number of issues. Mr. McDowell, did you hear my statement, or were you gone for that portion? I came on for the end of it, I apologize. Okay. Um, well, you go back and you rewatch the Zoom. <laughs> no, I'm, I'm just kidding. Uh, my statement was that given the fact that it's a, a topic national um, n uh, across our state in regards to citizen review boards and their authority, I think that it would be a good idea under public safety to also be advocating or to be lobbying for the General Assembly to make some, some changes in that regard to be able to support what the citizens are asking for because it's out of our hands at a at a at a municipal level, and you know we're we're trying to do the work, but we don't have the ability to be meaningful and deliberate in how we deliver on what they're asking. So that would certainly be something that I'd like to be kept under consideration. Yes, ma'am, absolutely. And, and whatever's on the agenda is up to you all. We we work at your pleasure, of course. Um, I would say on that issue because it is such a a matter of statewide importance. That, that issue likely will not be carried by one municipality uh, that's something that i would work with uh, with other municipalities who've shown interest such as raleigh and charlotte and come up with a, a, a cohesive plan uh, to push that statewide because again I, I just don't think that an issue of that level of importance that would have such statewide and far-flung implications uh, will, will be something that one municipality would be able to get done agreed thank you mr mcdowell all right, thank you. Uh, Councilmember Kinston. Yes, Mayor. Most of my um, concerns have already been addressed because I do have a council member request that's coming on the next work session that will also require a uh, shared municipality um, lobbyist um, agreement. So I would definitely uh, welcome the fact of being able to keep this open so that we can add some additional items. Okay, thank you, Councilmember Ingram. Thank you, Mayor. And I share the same sentiment as Councilmember Kingston. I also want to um, ask about affordable housing. Um, Mr. Mr. Hewitt, I know that we allocated funding to bring in a, is Mr. Chess on, did he leave? No, oh, I'm, he's there. I'm okay. back. I'm sorry. Okay. My um, computer died. I had to come back on my phone. Okay. I didn't see you anymore. My apologies. I know that we, um, we allocated funding to do a study on what it would take to increase our affordable housing inventory yes so i as i recognize that's probably going to implement um come with some rec recommendations on policy um will we then turn this over to our state lobbyists um so that they will know exactly how to move with these recommendations um they will of course um have access to it um the affordable housing inventory and strategy that you're going to be looking at is probably going to try to uh, quantify something that we all know, which is that the rents in Fayetteville are higher um, because of the military supplement that people get to rent. And it makes it very hard for folks in what you would have workforce housing for them to find adequate housing uh, that meets their interests and needs. Um, we armed with that, they may be able to help us identify certain programs, grants, or opportunities at the statewide level that we could apply for, but largely it would have its own strategy, as you mentioned, that would come in with, this is your problem, these are some steps that we would encourage you to take. Some of that may be a legislative fix. Thank you. And City Manager, as we look for a balance, and, and I'm glad you mentioned that military is why rent is so high, because military has the money to pay that. But uh, a regular citizen that just comes to Fayetteville, that lives in Fayetteville just to live, work, and recreate, which is all the things we want them to do here, 
they may not have the military salary or extra stipend. And so as we, I think that also plays a role in the developers that we choose to work with. And we also need to broaden that, our, that, that inventory as well in terms of the developers we work with in this city. And Mr. Chess, um, I want to thank you, especially uh, Mr. John Easterling, who is very knowledgeable and a fellow millennial for all the great work you guys are doing. Um, uh, so thank you so much. Thank, thank you, ma'am. Um, Councilman Wright. Uh, yes, Mr. Mayor, my questions were asked and comments. Uh, was already um, taken care of, so I'm good. Thank you. All right. Well, Mr. Chaz, we appreciate it, sir. Um, I think we've covered all of our questions. We look forward to uh, sending you some additional items up there. And so, Council, with that, maybe entertain a motion to receive a report with. So, move to receive Mayor, the report, Mayor sir. Mayor Colvin, oh, okay. There is also an administrative report. I just want to make sure we were going to go over that. We're not at that yet. Okay. All right. All right, Council, um, there's a motion by Council Member Hare to receive the report. Uh, it looks like a second by Council Member Kinston. Um, any discussion on the motion? All right, Council, I'll look to you for your votes. That, that was discussion. Ma'am? That was discussion. What, your vote? That was, you asked your green light? discussion, yes. It's okay. Yes. I'll ask my question later. It's fine. All right. Is, is it germane to your decision on the vote? All right, uh, Councilman, all right. Madam Clerk, that is unanimous. All right, uh, motion carries. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Chaz. Thank you all. Have a good night. Yes, sir. Um, the administrative report, that is, uh, the way I understand that, that is something that um, if there's an interest, it can be uh, scheduled for a work session, but it's not for discussion tonight. So it's for your own pleasure to read. Uh, according to the city manager, this is a time where he gives back the uh, information that we were asked uh, him to provide, and um, it can go on a future work session. So is there a, uh, a desire to do that? Councilman Davis? Mr. Mayor, I make a motion that we add this item to a future work session for further discussion, giving council members an opportunity to look over the information that has been presented uh, to us. All right, that's a motion by Council Member Davis. It looks like that's a, second, a second, by second. That's not a second. Okay. All right, so there's a second by Council Member Hare. Is that a second? Y your light is a second? Okay. All right. Uh, discussion on the motion. Council Member Ingle. Thank you. Mayor, Mayor Colvin, I, I guess I'm looking for some feedback from staff on how our – how are we supposed to be, I guess, governed by these administrative reports? Um, it, is, it was new knowledge to me to learn that we had to request for this to come back to work session, and not everything automatically comes back to work session. So I would like some clarity on these administrative reports and potentially needs to go in our policy if we are going to receive, because there are some very important things that come in our administrative reports that if we don't say anything about it and we just assume that it's gonna go to work session when they're not gonna come to work session, we will miss out. So, Council, uh, great point. It was a conversation I had with the manager who prepares these agendas uh, before it's presented to Council to adopt or not. Right. This was a, a way in which he um, had chosen to be able to answer the questions. Um, but, Mr. Manager, can you explain that for you, Yes, counsel? sir. Um, when we were reporting back on the council member request, um, just given the, um, the, the, the number and the, the nature of them and trying to be responsive, you would have uh, an item come up at a work session, and it was our goal within that month, if possible, to have the research completed and we would put it on it as administrative report. Um, twice on the agenda we listed, on the printed agenda, that if there were any items that administrative reports that you wish to discuss, the suggestion was that you ask for consensus to move it to a work session very similar to what we did here. Understanding that we did not um, spend a lot of time talking about that process, um, um, I mentioned to the Mayor, Mayor Pro Tem last week that Given that, I will move all of those items that were on as administrative reports for which were council member requests onto an upcoming work session um, that uh, for you guys to have hopefully um, a short presentation from staff and give us direction. 
given that there were seven items and that we already have six council member requests for November, um, it is, it literally was just a way for staff to be able to report back and then if once you had the information, um, if there was interest to do more with it, let's say you like the red light cameras, then it would be, Mayor, I'd like to assign this to the work session upcoming for us to do X. Again, there was some lack of clarity around that from a staff to council perspective, but literally just the number of, of requests, it was, it would, again, now we have seven plus almost six, and not trying to say that's too many. I want to be clear about that. But I, I, that's not a staff decision. But it was simply a way for us to get you the information back at a regular meeting. And again, we tried twice on the agenda in two different locations to say, but again, it did, at this point in the, of the evening, we're all ready to leave, and I think that it just got caught up in the mix. But so, Mr. I have a, I have a follow-up question. So as I'm, I want, just want to make sure there's some clarity. These administrative reports are ways for to get quick answers via our council member requests. Yes or no? Is that what I'm understanding? For some of the for the council member requests, that was the policy. Unless of course council gives us direction during a council member request such as we want a policy about closed session meetings. Okay. Then the clerk might prepare that um, as an item and it shows up. But so these are, but for the council member request, that was a process that we were putting in place. This item, which is before you tonight, is an update on what was a council um, strategy three or four years ago. And it's just a, it's a quarterly update, Jay? Quarterly, quarterly update that we provide um, and it's uh, against council's goal for um, uh, small and local business initiatives that we have. And so the kind of direction that we had tonight um, was um, to put it on for a work session. But typically, when we've done this, council wants to know, are we hitting the 40% local spend? And right now we're at 38 or 39? Right. And so those are the types of things that um, there isn't, it's a way for us to document. We're giving you the information back on a quarterly or timely basis. But again, the confusion at the last meeting was my own, uh, created by me, and um, as an alternative to try to at least fix that, we're um, proposing to put those items on for the upcoming work session. But l looking to, for council to tell us what would be an appropriate way to, um, to kind of, in a timely way, get that stuff back to you. Well, city manager, before before I get the floor up, I just there's something that that I'm trying to understand. So there was an administrative report, and the administrative report was administrative report for the Central Camberton Neighborhood Plan. I've not made ever a council member request about the B Street community, and I don't know where this information came from. And so while I was assuming it was going to come back to a work session, I had no idea that I needed to. And you cleared that up. But it seems like it's more than just the council member requests, which is why it's why to come to us. It's more of a quarterly update. And so I was just trying to make sure, how is this getting on here? And I've not made this request. So I want to make sure I understand clearly what is all going to fall in this administrative report. Administrative reports are very simply just that. I mean, this is a council initiative on small and local business um, uh, uh, contracting. That is something that uh, just want to make council aware we go along. Um, uh, the taxes are something else that you see from time to time, statement of taxes. It is a way for us to um, give you information that you can read at your leisure. Region, read at your leisure. And, yeah. uh, but again, if there's any item that, um, uh, that council wants to discuss more, the... Oh. I, I had this conversation with, with the manager because I, w I needed a little clarification because I looked at the previous year's agenda and the things that were on there were uh, refunds under $100 and uh, tax uh, taxes. And those were things that you could read if, if you wanted to read it or not. Um, and now with some of the responses to the questions with the request, you know, maybe there's a meeting that we scheduled to kind of talk up, talk through that process a bit about how we get back the information if there's a consensus of council. But these res administrative items, uh, whether they were all council member requests or council member requests and taxes and or refunds over a hundred dollars, 
art to be read in your in your leisure time is the way we've handled that and not not during during the meeting. And so I understand that it yeah, was well, thank you, man. It I was, was just clear. wanting to make sure I, no, I, I had got you. Clear to because I asked the same question. I was a little confused myself. But I think the manager cleared it up. We got a couple of questions uh, tonight. Counselor, if you have interest, I think um, one of the committees had talked about this in a little bit more detail about the percentages of, of minority participation in local business. If you have questions about it or if the council wants more of a, uh, of, a, of a discussion about it, we can kick it to a work session. But, council, we're averaging five council member requests per uh, work session in opposed to the previous years of, of one and a half. And so there's there's only but so much you can do in that allotted time for one month, meeting a month. So maybe Dr. Manzo will kind of help us work through that. But um, now I'll go to Councilmember Banks McLaughlin, Kinston, and then Council will be ready to end this tonight. Thank you, um, City Manager, for kind of explaining because I guess it was a miscommunication. I know I submitted um, a request regarding the Lowell Harris dump site, and that was a few months ago before they actually closed the facility and I sent out an email once I realized it wasn't on our next um, work session meeting I think yeah no, our, our next meeting and um, you responded back as far as we'll have it on the next work session so then last week well was it, a couple of weeks ago I was like hoping that it'll be on that meeting and that's when we received the agenda um, the administrative report and before we were leaving out I asked um, the mayor is that you know are we finished are we going to go through that you said it'll be on our next work session meeting which is which if, if the council sent it to us okay well i i would like to make a consistency because it's kind of back and forth i know originally when i put in i don't request in the past and ask um the council to vote on staff to bring that information back to present it they've presented it so that's something new to myself as far as the administrative report. So I would like to see if we can have a meeting and kind of discuss the correct protocol. Yeah, I think we need to clear that up, which is part of what yeah. you know, he's hearing. I think and there's then, a consensus situation. Okay, and then also, City Manager, you said it'll be going back to the next work session, the next five. So when would that be? Next week. Then, okay, I just wanted to, on record. Okay, so next week you'll be bringing all seven of the All items seven. Items okay, all thank you. Six new items. I mean, one of the things I would um, point out uh, to council, the work that Dr. Manzo did earlier tonight, I'm hopeful that once we are able to work through um, uh, uh, the, the past items and the items which are on the table tonight, that I think what y'all had asked Dr. Manzo to do was to come up with a process to try to um, uh, identify how we can capture the interest of council for course corrections throughout the year or the request for additional information as well. So I think that is what she's working on and will come back with. Um, but uh, Well, um, you, said, you said something we need clarification on. Even though there were seven requests for items from the last work session, all seven did not receive consensus to move to even be discussed this next time. Well, um, there was, um, because there was no, the meeting ended so fast, I don't think that anyone knew that they needed to pull. Not the I council meeting where there was an administrative report. Right. So the way you explain this to me, and I, we need a clarification on this, if there's a council member request that receives a consensus mm -hmm. to ask staff to engage more time and, and resources, then it comes back as an administrative request. That's where you've been placing them, good, bad, or different, indifferent, but you've been put, putting them here. Then if, as you were explaining it, you were saying then another step would have had to been taken to talk about it a little further, not at this meeting. But my point is, is that all seven items, even though we had seven requests, all seven items didn't receive a consensus the last time. It's, it's in the record, whatever it is. Right. Whatever council said we want more information about, the items that didn't get a council consensus didn't move forward. So there's no need to come to this work session with Correct. those last seven plus a new six. So the if, if again not to to belabor the point since we're going to actually bring them, um, but the items I'm talking about are roll cart replacement, red light cameras, closure of Low Harris dump site, Richard Street closure, property owner code enforcement fines, donation clothing boxes, and city council live streaming. All of those did receive a favorable nod from council for us to work on and to come back with information, um, and. Uh, so now what it is is that you're going back to the previous meetings where it would have taken an effort to move it, and you're now reversing that? 
how, when did you change the pro I mean, that was I what we discussed uh, last week, that because there was confusion, mm -hmm. that it's impossible for me to be able to, without council guidance, to say that. Well, here, here's what I think needs to happen, because you, you gave back the information. Mm -hmm. And time is all that you have, folks. And so I think if you send us those seven, get a consensus from council as to the ones that we look to, to put on, because we can't do 13 council member requests plus anything else that you're talking about in a reasonable amount of time. Because what's happened is we're taking things that need to be discussed in detail and having to move it to later, like we did the solid waste and trash litter pickup, which is a strategic plan item, because we had so many requests. And council, I'm going to be very frank, the request as outlined in our policy says that there are five minutes for discussion total. So, you know, I know we've been a little uh, lo loose with that, but in order for the sake of time, because of the, the mere number until Dr. Manzo gives us some guidance on that, uh, we'll, it'll be a five minute total for the six new items. So it's not, you know, whatever it is, that will be five minutes times six is 30 minutes allocated for that. But Doug, I would, I would like to do that, let council look at that, because yeah. if some of us were in the impression that we were satisfied with the feedback uh, or if we needed more information, I think that's something that should have been talked about. Going back now, retro, is, is uh, something that I think is, uh, is is not right. But we'll go to Council Member Kinston. Thank you, Mayor. And some of the questions have been answered, but my concern is with, um, as we discussed, with City Council Policy uh, 115.15, uh, based on the protocol, some of the ways, the only way that we can get um, answers is by doing a council member request. Uh, so my concern is that if we're submitting the councilman request and we're getting the approval of council, being able to hear the information back. Um, I was one of the ones that had the understanding that when I did ask last week about the red light cameras with some additional concerns, as I discussed with council member Dawkins, that it would come back to the work session. So um, I think it's going to be very beneficial when Dr. Manz um, Manziel comes back that that particular policy is looked at because even though we may have an abundance of requests, those requests are some requests that are coming from our constituents, and therefore I think you know it's important that we do have oh, yeah. the, the option of being able to get those information out there and get that information back. Well, the previous the way that they used to do it uh, was that it would come back to a work session, but the, Mr. Manager is trying to bring it back within 30 days, and so sometimes some of the stuff is not time sensitive and it would come back. There was a way to, to keep up with it as it came back, like, you didn't need to answer to a red light camera discussion. Let's say, for example, I'm not getting into the merits of it by the end of the next month because it wasn't something that had an expiration date. But you do have a time that you need to discuss it if there's going to be a legislative change. You know what I mean? So the manager used that discretion. This, this process that, that the manager has implemented here I don't think was kind of communicated well, and that's, what, that's why we're here. But I think we all agree that, uh, that we will. But I would say for the sake of, unless that's all we plan to tackle with the next work session, being that we only have two left for, for 2020, um, maybe in between then let's put in the work and actually read what's enclosed and see if there's a consensus or, or if our questions are not answered. Because the council member requests were for more information, right. which they're providing. If we want to take that information and do something else with it, let's, let's let it be known by consensus uh, or, converse, you know, support or non-support, but I, I'd hate to see it starting with 13 items. That's All right, so I think we got it. Uh, council, look to you for a motion to adjourn. All right, have a good night.